the jinx of Alvin Wyatt and Bethune Cookman next. Shiny day in Daytona Beach, and we're at Municipal Stadium as the Aggies of North Carolina A&T come in to take on Bethune Cookman in Miak College Football Saturday. Hello again, everyone. I'm Charlie Neal, and welcome to Miak College Football Saturday. A year ago, when these two teams met up in Greensboro, it was homecoming for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Well, Bethune went into Greensboro and spoiled that homecoming with a 34-27 overtime victory. But more importantly, they knocked the Aggies out of a berth in the Heritage Bowl, earning themselves a bid to the annual event. The question today is, can the Wildcats be spoilers again for the Aggies, who come into today's game unbeaten in conference play at 4-0? Let me bring in my partner, Ronnie Duncan. And Ronnie, when you look at these two teams and you look at the stat line a lot of comparisons and they look very very similar you know you might be thinking you're looking at twins but then the big difference is on the defense both teams score around the same amount of points per game take a look at these numbers because they are extremely interesting 28.1 for ANT and then you've got 26.4 for BCC but the difference is in defense look at that rushing defense per game 116 compared to 132 both of these guys can stop the run except ANT is the best in the conference and one of the best in the nation and when you talk about one of the best in the, in the nation, looking at their defense, they're ranked number one in the conference, as you, was evidenced by the stat line there. But Daryl Clue is the man who holds the defense together. Daryl Clue is the glue. You might as well talk about a guy who is an All-America candidate. The reason why, last week in a big victory over Howard, two block punts. He's an exceptional player, and look at those numbers. They are not that impressive, but obviously people are afraid to go to his side. But he's going to have to have a good game today because, of course, we know the type of option offense that the Thune Cookman likes to run, led by their quarterback, Patel Trop. You know I love this kid. Patel, Patel, you're the man. If you can't do it, nobody can. Six touchdowns so far this season, 600 yards, but guess what? 19 to 24 passing in the last two games. I think he's on target for a big one today. It should be interesting. It's the 23rd meeting between Bethune and the Aggies, and Bethune leads the series 13 to 9, and they've won the last two. And we'll be back with the opening kickoff from Bethune Cookman's College in a moment. He is sponsored in part by Priority Mail from the U.S. Postal Service. The Marines, the few, the proud, the Marines. By National Car Rental. So what are you waiting for? Let's go. Municipal Stadium, Daytona Beach, Florida. You look at Bill Hayes, the head coach of the Aggies of North Carolina ANTs. Schools all-time winning as coach in his 12th year. And the weather here in Daytona Beach is 81 degrees, sunny, and the winds are very light for these two running-oriented, run-oriented teams. The officials for today's game is assigned by the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. Our referee is Artie Cobb. The umpire is Dwight Wettiford, uh, Pettiford, the head linesman. He is Ted White, line judge Todd Reese, side judge Moses Norman, back judge Eric McCoy, and field judge Chris Brown. And Alvin White is the head coach of the Wildcats at Bethune-Cookman College. And Jeff Rumlin is down on the sideline with Alvin White right now. Thank you, Charlie. Coach White, today's game, very important for you. A win puts you back into the race for the Heritage Bowl. What have you told your team in this week's preparation? Well, we're only concerned about the team that's immediately in front of us right now, and that's North Carolina a and uh, 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 We know that uh, in 1997, 96, this man put 73 points on us with no mercy at all. So we're still thinking about that, and that's still in the back of our mind, and, and we're ready to play. I think our guys are ready to meet the challenge today. Thanks, Coach. Good luck. Charlie, back to you. All right, Jeff, and uh, Alvin White has never forgotten that. That was when he was a defensive <laughs> coordinator uh, before he took over as the head coach at Bethune, and since that time, he he has won two straight from Bill Hayes. So Bill Hayes has never beaten Alvin Wyatt as since Alvin has taken over as head coach. And Alvin Wyatt's team booms the ball out of the end zone. And it'll be brought out to the 20. The Aggies will get first dibs on the football this afternoon. 
And they will go on offense. They will start Rod uh, Jason Battle at the quarterback spot as we look at the USPS starting lineups for the Aggies. Quasi Mitchell, Chris Kenlock, Victor Marte, Chad Mann, and John Hall up front that averaged 317. And in the backfield is Farmer and Mo Smith. Chris Caldwell, Darius Helton, and Rodney Bush are the receivers. This is a team that comes in 6-1. and one. Overall 4-0 in the conference, and they keep the ball on the ground, and Eric Farmer out of Sutherland, Virginia, gets the carry. Third leading scorer in the MEAC. Came into the day's game with seven rushing touchdowns and one by way of the pass. Defensively, the USPS starting lineup for the Wildcats of Bethune-Cookman up front. Damian Cook, Paul James, Abdul Yates, and Willie Doby. The linebackers are Dr. James and Jimmy Williams. And the secondary, Rashane Matthews, Mathis rather, Lonnie Estes, Joe Giddens, and Jason McCoy. Back to pass on second down and complete to Farmer for the first down. Still on his feet and Farmer out to the 45-yard line. A great run after catch by Eric Farmer, who came into today's game with just six receptions and Terry Doctor finally had to make the stop. Terry Doctor had to bring down a big guy, 309 yards on the season, but what I like about this guy, he can get the yard at 5.8. He has seven touchdowns to lead them in the backfield. So Jason Battle completes his first pass, came into today's game 19 of 31, four touchdowns, only one interception. He came in in relief of Woodruff earlier in the season when Wood Rod Woodruff uh, went down with an injury, and he hasn't given up the job since. Here's Mo Smith, and he's running over Bethune-Cookman Wildcats. Lawrence finally tripped him up, but not before he got into Bethune territory, and the ball is spotted all the way down to the 37-yard line. So here's a team that came into the game averaging 226 yards a contest, rushing. Last time I saw Mo Smith, he looked awesome, and right now he's getting off to a great start. You talk about the Hatfield and McCoys, well, there's nothing like Hayes going up against Wyatt. When these two coaches get together, fireworks will explode, and these two teams, if you saw them before the game, they were humping, they were pumping, they were thumping, they wanted to get it on. Second man through is Mo Smith again. Doctor hits him as he hits the line of scrimmage, and he's finally stopped by Joe Giddens, the free safety out of Mainland High in Daytona Beach, but not before a pickup of about four or five yards on the play. Make it four. Take a look at this because there's a little holding there, but see, you got to get him and you got to wrap him down. But you saw it on the left-hand side of your screen. You can't do that, but they got away with it with the official. They call it a three-yard gain, make it second down and seven. The ball resting inside the 35 at the 34-yard line. The lone setback behind the quarterback is Mo Smith. Back to pass. Battle. Has a complete, but not much running room for Marcus. By Bryson, who is the tight end. Actually, Marcus uh, back to the line of scrimmage, and that's about it for him, his sixth reception of the year. He's out of Lawrence, South Carolina, number 88. It may be a six reception of the year, but when you look at this kid, he has 103 yards. It's good pursuit, but what you like about it is that when they put him in the game, he's used to catch the ball. He is their second string tight end. However, number 88, anytime he's in the game, that means they're throwing to his side of the ball. And once again, you can see what Bill Hayes is doing. He's mixing up the offense. We've seen two very long runs by Farmer as well as Maurice, and then you see the tight end. That's something that's going to throw off this defense, and Terry Doctor's got to get it together to anchor the defense for Bethune Cooper. Battle back to pass on the play action. Runs left. Has to throw in the opposite direction. And he's going to be swarmed over by Terry Doctor. And he gets some help from his friends on the far sideline over there. Doctor made a house call. I called his name, and the doctor had to bring him down. And as you can see right there, Battle was looking for some action. He was looking for some room on the football field to move. But that swarming defense. They call it the wide attack. We're going to see the wide bone in just a few minutes. And I was talking about it earlier. The young man who's the quarterback for this team, he's put together the games offensively as well as with the run and pass. You know what happened there? He didn't release the ball. He had an opportunity where he kind of got rid of that ball, but he chose to keep it to himself, and now they've got to punt. Anthony Moore is the man back to do the punting. He's averaging 35 yards per punt, number four in the conference in that department. And not a good kick for him as the ball goes out of bounds just at about the old 27, 28 yard line. So when we come back, Bethune will get the ball.
USPS starting lineups for the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats, the Wyatt Bone as they call it. As you look at Sarde, Brown, Herndon, Butler, and Cooper up front, they average 290 pounds. Turin Porter, Reginald Williams, and Jay Rogers, the backs, the Alvin backs as they like to be called. Eric Lash and Terry and Hubbard are the wide receivers, and Patel Troutman, number four in total offense in the conference, second leading rusher as a quarterback, and I shouldn't say that, and I should say second leading rusher overall in the conference, but as a quarterback, that's kind of unheard of. Normally that is related to or given to the quarterback or running backs as we get a flag. Probably going to have a little illegal procedure and a five-yard penalty against Bethune-Cookman right off the bat. One interesting thing about Patel Troutman is simply this. You add up the yards, rushing 600. Offside, offense, five yards, first down. You add up the yards offensively, rushing 600 yards. You add up the yards as far as passing, he has over 400. So you put it together, he has over 1,000 yards. He is such a valuable player. So goes Patel Troutman, so goes Bethune-Cookman. It's just that simple. You stop him, you can win this game. From Seabreeze High, right here in Daytona, homegrown, never left. Used to hang out around Bethune as he was growing up. He's under pressure, out of the shotgun, he runs it upfield running room and has finally run out of bounds in front of the a and t bench on the far sideline but not before patel troutman came uh, back close to picking up the first down let's watch the uh, foot speed of patel troutman a short by about a yard and a half he can definitely move with the football and he can get by the linebackers that's what's so impressive and he will shake you and he will bake you and if he does your toast and the usps defensive lineup for the Aggies of North Carolina and t McGee, Relaford, Williams, and Paler, the men up front. Here's Troutman again looking to pass. In trouble. And a flag is down, maybe holding, and it goes incomplete. Closest man and almost intercepted by Dwayne Carpenter. Let's look at the rest of the defense. Let's look at the linebackers, Sammy Rogers, along with uh, B.J. Little, Ray Massey, are the linebackers. We also have Sammy Rogers, Dwayne Carpenter, Tamel Perkett is a secondary man, along with J uh, Josh Rogers. And we spoke of Daryl Clue, who has two interceptions coming in. There's Alvin Wyatt, all decked out in the latest styles as normal. 17-11 is his record in three seasons. But of course, the one game that he will not forget is the North Carolina anti game, 73-6. No question about it, but last year they went in, they were down 19-7 to the Aggies in Greensboro, and uh, they scored three times in a three-minute span in the fourth quarter, and only used eight plays to get back in the game. They had a four-play drive, a three-play drive, and then they recovered a fumble, ran it in 23 yards for a touchdown and made the difference. Here's the option from the shotgun. Troutman pitches back and turning the corner, trying to get some running room is Turin uh, Porter, the receiver out of Birmingham, Alabama, looking to pick up the first down, and he does. Charlie, that was an interesting play three. because the Maybe linebackers doesn't. have to move extremely well on a play like this, and they tried to make the blitz, but what happened was Patel Troutman picked up the blitz. He gives the ball, of course, over to Porter. Porter perhaps gets it, and it's first down four. Well, they're going to measure. I think he may be short of a first down. Just by a nose. Just by a nose by if he's short at all. Yeah. Third down, and uh, they're calling it two. Third and about two. He has to get to the 39-yard line. Remember, remember, this drive started at the 29. And straight ahead on the option again. Here's Troutman. Slips down. He may have just gotten at his knee. Went down, but he is spotted at the 40-yard line. So he does pick up the first down. The turf not kind to him on that particular run and uh, attempt to cut back. One thing about the defense of the Aggies, one of the best in the country, and they will have to move laterally from the left side to the right side. This Troutman right there finally being brought down. But when you consider how good this defense is, against the pass, they only give up 116.8 yards a game, rushing 216 yards per game, and total defense 229. You talk about shutting it down, they can shut you down, but their job is going to be full with the white ball today. And they keep the ball on the ground and go straight ahead. And you're speaking of uh, what they've been able to do. They have 14 rushing touchdowns to their credit this year. They average 48 running plays a game. And while they only average about 17 passes a game. And uh, as you said, 
three over the uh, 2300 total offensive yards this year. 2340 to be exact, but 1400 of it comes by way of the run. Well, if you go back to last week's game against Howard University, what was impressive was the simple fact number 27, Daryl Clue was able to get two block punts. Those block punts led to touchdowns and early scores. Before you knew it, Howard's down 21 to nothing. Trotman back to pass, incomplete, intending it for Porter, and he's being covered downfield. I like a blanket by Josh Rogers out of West Charlotte High. What was so impressive about that, Josh Rogers was able to get his hands on the football over the back of the receiver. That's something they have been working on all day long. As a matter of fact, when I was down there watching them as they got ready for this game in preparation, this was a drill, and Josh played the drill perfectly. The field not uh, looking like we've had the best footing. There was a little rain earlier in the week, uh, little showers overnight. There was a high school football game here last night which uh, Mainland came out with a big victory, and so the field doesn't have the best footing. We've seen some slips earlier. Here's Troutman trying to turn the corner, and he went out of bounds, chased out of bounds by Dwayne Carpenter out of Troy, North Carolina. One of the reasons why number 92, Leonard Relifer, was able to get into the backfield from the defensive end position on the left-hand side, leaving no room for Patel Troutman to move, and when that happened, the defense was able to get right to him and bring him down. One of the things that the Aggies learned from playing an option team one that they played earlier this year and lost to that was Elon College they lost 40 to 7 in fact gave up 346 yards on the ground they're the only other option team that they played this year well obviously the key when you're playing against the option is something Billy Hayes is doing right now sending nine sometimes ten guys to the line you can make a dangerous play there because you believe a wide receiver dead open down the middle of the football field Jody Spear is back to punt it away. Chris Caldwell signals a fair catch, but lets it go over his head, and it's going to die inside the two at about the one-yard line. They're going to actually mark it probably at about the four, and that's where the Aggies will have to go to work. We have no score, and we're in the first quarter in Daytona Beach. Duncan, Jeff Rumlin here in Daytona Beach at Municipal Stadium. No score between the Aggies and Bethune Cookman. Aggies were a wing T team for 10 years, and this year they've gone to the multiple eye. And they feel they're in that multiple eye, they have more man to man blocking versus when they had the uh, the wing T offense. It was a lot of pulling and trapping type of an offensive blocking scheme that the linemen had to be concerned about. We had a flag. So far, it's the offense. Had the distance of the goal. First down. So the Aggies penalized for a false start. Both teams maybe have gotten those jitters out of the way. The Aggies came into today's game averaging 66 yards in penalties per contest, while Bethune Cookman was averaging about 74 yards in penalties. You know, when you're a defensive tackle, defensive end, these are the moments you live for because you're looking for the safety if you can stop them. And that's exactly what happened there, stopping that rush. As a matter of fact, they got on them big time. And that's what has to happen, pulling that pressure up front and making sure that the defense makes sure that nobody gets to move the football. Abdul Yates was the man in there out of St. Petersburg. Florida co-captain he was a former running back believe it or not two years ago if you look at the punt once again Chris Caldwell way over his head he had to let it go and so far it's second down and uh, we'll call it 13 second and 12 right? that half the distance penalty here it is again and nothing happening again for the offense is Tony Hubbard looked like the man who submarine the running back that time Mo Smith Nobody got a block on Tony Hubbard. He was able to plug in that hole and take a listen to exactly what happens down the field because, man, he puts the pain on, of course, Mr. Moore. So to bring up a third down, third and uh, at about 12, the ball rights resting back at the three-yard line for the Aggies. Third down conversions. There's six in that department this year. And look at the big hole. And almost a first down picked up on the running play. That's why Mo Smith is so dangerous. Uh, he's third in rushing in the conference with 586 yards, averaging 6.8 yards every time he touches the ball. As long as the sticks don't move along for another first down, it's null and void. Maybe he came out big, but Terry Doctor was there with the tackle. And what I liked about Terry Doctor on that play is that he went extremely from the left-hand side over to the right-hand side to make the stop. So again, another punting situation facing 
The Aggies of North Carolina NT. That brings on Anthony Moore out of Wadesboro, North Carolina, senior. So they have another jumping offensive line person that's created another offsides or illegal procedure penalty. And so that pushes Anthony Moore back into the deep part of the end zone. Sean Matthews is deep to receive the punt for the Bill Cookman Wildcats. He has a chance to run this one back. Feels it. At about the 47 yard line, we get a flag and we may have holding or push in the back. Let's see. Ball at the 47 yard line. That's a 35 yard punt for Anthony Moore, who's averaging 35 yards per punt. And the penalty is against Bethune, preliminary indication from Marty Cobb, our referee. So this drive will move the ball, or penalty will move it over the midfield line. Illegal block in the back, above the way. Penalty to be 10 yards at the end of the run. So Bethune starts at their own 43-yard line. Let's watch it. Let's see if we can see it. There it is, right there. As a matter of fact, Arthur Wilson, he's number 54. He was the guy that would have definitely wrapped him up early. He gets pushed in the back. And, of course, it hurts his tackle. And it was Fred Flowers who was caught with the illegal block. So it is first down and 10 from their own 43-yard line. 7-0-1 left in the first quarter. No score. And Bethune-Cookman with the football and keeping the ball on the ground. Running straight ahead. On the carry that time, Jeremy Thomas. Jeremy's been in the backfield today. Out of Daytona Beach, he's a redshirt freshman, a young man who transferred from Purdue University. Came in with a 4.0 average every time he's touched the ball. Patel Trot. And he has Jeremy Thomas behind him. On the option, and he almost fumbled the ball. If he didn't, I believe he did. It was not a good handoff between Patel Trotman and Jeremy Thomas. Trotman never got the ball in there, or he got it in there and was trying to decide whether to leave it in there or pull it out for the option, and the ball hit the ground. You know, once again, working on the great technique, and you will see Robert Williams. He will get inside, and he will smother. See, this is something that they work on at a &T. The Aggies are always looking to strip the football from the opposition. That's why they come up with the costly turnover in this game. Well, you can't call that a forced fumble in that particular situation because the ball really was never in the stomach of Jeremy Thomas. So the Aggies get the ball. Little Smith trying the left side. Slips and tackle. Finally was ridden down on the far side of the field by Joe Giddens. Giddens out of Mainland High in Daytona Beach. That may be the case, but they were always looking for the football, a nose for the football. The Aggies have that. And remember, last week against Howard, they were able to penalize and take advantage of some penalties and, of course, some turnovers and turn them into points. If they're able to do this today, that is another indication how strong this defense is. You hear about Maurice Smith. You hear about Jason Battle. But it's the guys on the defense, and I'm looking forward to seeing, of course, B.J. Little. That's a good guy. Ray Massey getting the job done time and and time again and that's why they're so good and undefeated in conference play and terry doctor is ailing down on the field right now and they're out looking at him terry doctor out of south miami high you look at him and the stats on him a phys ed major 26 years of age preseason defensive player of the year and has made the numbers he's number two in the conference in tackles and tackles for losses that is dropping opponents with for no gain I tell you what, came into the game with 65 tackles, unassisted 43. If this guy goes down, it will be a huge loss for Bethune-Cookman because he is the anchor of this defense. When you consider 65 tackles coming into this game, when Terry Doctor plays well from that linebacker position, he is sitting up that middle and making sure that he can see the entire defense, and he's the man for the game. And he's uh, limping off. It looks like the left ankle, the left leg. That's what's ailing him now, Terry Doctor. Last year had four sacks. This year, he has not been credited with a sack, but he has an interception. As I said, he's tackled a closing running back ten times for losses. But it is a first down for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. We just uh, got the ball by way of a recovered fumble. And they have the ball down at the 37-yard line of Bethune-Cookman. 
and the pitch back to Mo Smith. Mo turns the corner into the secondary, and he's on his way. Mo Smith will not be caught, and it is a touchdown for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. An instant impact right there. Terry Doctor goes out. Mo Smith goes 37 yards for the touchdown. 37 yards, and he did it so effortlessly. When you watch number 43, watch this once again. And obviously, the absence of Terry Doctor was definitely there because if Terry Doctor had been in the football game at that time, maybe this game would not be A&T up six to nothing. Watch this move here. You talk about a big fellow who can move. He looks like a fullback. He is 6'3. He averages over seven yards a carry now that average is going to move up i'm talking mo smith a second look at this guy he made it look easy ever since i saw him against norfolk state i knew he was a star in the making he could definitely be all meac this season and for that young man maurice smith that is his fifth rushing touchdown this year his longest run was 80 yards Ball, celebration unsportsmanlike against the team North Carolina coming to be assessed on its try. Okay, on to for the point after is Darren Dawkins out of Westchester, Pennsylvania, who has hit on 19 of 22 PATs this year, ranked fifth in the conference in points after touchdowns, and that equals into 86%. But there is a penalty. Phillips is going to be assessed on the, well, I guess they're assessing it now. Anyway, it'll be a long extra point. That's what it's going to wind up being for that young man, Darren Dawkins. Last time we did a game here, we saw some great things from the defense as well as the offense. Antonio Stanley, not with us today, can't play. He's missed the excitement. Obviously, he's missed for Bethune Cookman. But the man they will miss on defense, so evident in the last play we just saw, Terry Dawkins. And the extra point is good. So we have a 7-0 ball game. And the Aggies get on the board first. 6.04 left, first quarter. One of the surprise teams in the MEAC this season is Delaware State. The Hornets come into today's action with just one conference loss. Let's listen to some of this season's highlights. Matthews to throw. Little shovel pass underneath the King. A lot of room to midfield. To the 45-40. To the 30. To the 20. He could go all the way. He will. They give it to Hanks up the middle, and Hanks breaks through the 35, 30, 20, 10, see you later. Kevin Hanks on Gordon Short goes the distance. Touchdown, Delaware State. Lester wants the pitch on the option. The ball is fumbled. He's going to pick it up by a horn. That's the state here, and you are not going to catch the state of it from behind. We want to thank Dennis Jones of Delaware State for that fine video. They take on FAMU today. Could be an interesting game, especially when you talk about Dell State. A lot of people look at the Hornets and say, hey, we can beat the Hornets. They see them on the schedule. Not anymore. All of a sudden, the Hornets are putting a big sting in the MEAC. And for all you doubting Thomases, let me tell you, folks, it's great football in this conference. And don't be surprised if Delaware State pulls it off. It was a two-play, 47-yard drive, 21 seconds off the clock. The point after was good. And 7 to nothing. And now ANT gets the ball back. They get the ball back right at the 27, 28-yard line. So another mistake by Bethune is going to put the Aggies in great scoring position on the kick return. Ahmad Blakely could not get to the football, had trouble getting his footing because the ball bounced in front of him. Let's watch it. You know, watch this, and you will see Ahmad will come up with the football. He's playing alert football. He says, you know what, Charlie? I can turn that turnover into something positive. That's exactly what he did. should say what Curtis the... Williams from Bethune is the man who never could get his foot, feet on it or his hands on it, couldn't get his footing, number 82. And Blakeney was wise and smart enough to come up with the football. It's Billy Hayes football. It's alert football. It's capitalizing on the other team's mistakes. He does it time and time again. Maurice Smith again trying to turn the corner, but this time Tony Hubbard was there to wrap him up, not let him get loose this time. But he still picked up about three yards on the play to be second down and seven. And speaking of the Delaware State team, they're three and one in the 
conference, even though they're three and four overall, they've made some surprise uh, adjustments this year. They came up with a big win uh, last week over Morgan. They beat some other schools, and they have a, a pretty tough schedule down the road, but I'll tell you, they've uh, really awakened some people as far as the conference is play. Uh, conference teams are concerned. John McKenzie, their coach, former quarterback at Jackson State, has done a great job. Back standing in there, battle, he turns inside, cuts in at the 15 and down to about the 12-yard line goes Jason Battle. Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, Rocky Mountain High, and it's a first down. Watch it. Watch him here, man. Jason Battle doesn't have anywhere to go, and he says, you know what? I got to find a way to get around, and he finds a way. Watch and see what he does here. Are you standing still, young man? <laughs> Not exactly, but you're going to have to bring him down with some company. There he is, Jason Battle, the quarterback, the sophomore who came in, and all of a sudden has set a spark into the Aggies offense. It is time to give it to the first man through, Eric Farmer. Farmer dives down to about the 10-yard line. Eric Farmer, there he is, the big fella from Sutherland, Virginia. Dan River High. It'll be second down. Gain of two, second and about eight. For the Aggies, who already lead it, seven to nothing. They recovered a fumble by the Bethune Cookman Wildcats, drove 47 yards in a couple of plays. We got some movement by the left tackle. Wasim Mitchell out of New Bern, North Carolina. He jumped it down a little bit too soon that time. Off guard. This offense, five yards. For second down. So it's second down, and instead of second and about uh, eight, it'll be second and 13. Watch the left side. Here's Wasim Mitchell. Getting a little bit uh, of a head start on that play. You know, everyone wants to get off the ball first, and sometimes you can have the happy feet, and anxiety attacks can lead to penalties. Chris Kinlock is the center for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T as Jason Battle. And here's Mo Smith. And again, nothing happening. Hubbard is there to make sure he doesn't get too far. Tony Hubbard out of Riverview High in Sarasota, Florida. Had off-season knee surgery, uh, but he's right now the team's number two tackler, and he's doing a great job in that linebacker spot. When you look at this, you will see that number 42 is not the same type of player as Terry Doctor. I speak of Lydell Jackson. He cannot get that type of penetration on the offense. The doctor can, and you will see it happen time and time again. It's amazing how one player can change a game. And again, Mo Smith, the lone setback on third down and about 10. And we got a flag again. Battle in trouble. Battles trying to get the ball away, and he is going to be dropped down for a loss. And probably we'll see Bethune decline this penalty as he as uh, Taz Redden was there defensively, along with Clinton Lewis, and it's against the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Illegal shift against the offense. That penalty. They decline it. So it'll be fourth down. So let's see if they go with their field goal kicker, Danny Dawkins, who has hit on 66% of his field goal attempts this year. Six of nine. He's hit it for 42 is his longest. His longest is 42 yards. So let's see. And now a timeout has been called by Bethune-Cookman with three minutes and ten seconds to go. We're in the first quarter, and the Aggies leading it seven to nothing. First quarter, seven to nothing. The Aggies of North Carolina and T over Bethune. The Aggies now faced with a fourth down and about 17, but they're going to try a field goal. It'll be a 30-yard field goal attempt for Damon Hawkins, or Darren Hawkins, rather, Dawkins, who is, has kicked a 42-yarder this year. And the kick is up. It is long enough, and it looks like we have a good one. 
And it's 10 to nothing, the Aggies. So they've taken advantage of two miscues by Bethune Cookman. And they've put 10 points on the board, Ronnie. They've done it over and over again all this season. And the reason they have a good defense that will make you create mistakes, and they create the mistakes for you, and then they take advantage and score on you. And that's what you have to have. You have to have that balance of a football team. And everyone is somewhat surprised. I mean, let's face it, starting the season, no one thought that North Carolina A&T would be this good this late to the season. And you look at Bill Hayes on the sideline. Let's go down to Jeff Rumlin, who has an injury update on Terry Dr. Jeff. However, on the next defensive series, look for Terry Doctor to be back in the game. Back upstairs. All right, thank you, Jeff. A high ankle sprain. They do expect him to get back into the lineup. As you look at Alvin Wyatt on the sideline, 97. He was 4-7 and seven in his first year. Last year, they were 8-3. and three. So far this season, they're 5-2, and 2-2 two, two and two in the conference overall. So he's done a great job in turning this program around. But oh, he'll he never forget is. that... Uh, game against the Aggies in 1996. Three to seven. Yeah, he said they ran the score up on us. <laughs> you know, anytime, you know what, that happens in football. And let's face it, when you've got as many talented kids as North Carolina a and has, and let's face it, Billy Hayes is the type of individual, he plays all of his kids. If you're going to be recruited by North Carolina a and you're going to play for the Aggies, you will play. No question about it. On the return for Bethune Cookman, and not much running room for him is Carlos Lawrence. And Carlos brings out to about the 21, 22-yard line. There's Terry Docker on you the sideline. When he told us, and I'm talking rumbling, that he had an ankle sprain, the one thing I said to myself is it's going to take more than an ankle sprain to keep Terry Docter out of this football game. He's a bad man, and let's face it, that's why he leads his team in tackles, and he's the leader on defense. There's your Greyhound plays, five plays. It took one minute and 58 seconds, nine yards, a 37-yard field goal. Darren Dawkins, and that's our Greyhound scoring drive. Yeah, he had some room to spare. He could have... Uh, oh, man, he put his foot in that one. He certainly he? did. And you know what? It was a great camera angle. Our crew was doing an excellent job. Mattel Troutman. And again, Jeremy Thomas on the carry. Jeremy runs into a couple of bold jerseys, and Josh Rogers being one of them. Number five, there's Jeremy Thomas out of Daytona Beach. Transferred in here out of Purdue University. He's a redshirt freshman. And we're seeing more and more young men coming from schools like Purdue. We see the Cider down at Florida a m came in out of West Virginia. We're seeing a lot of these young men coming back to the historically black institutions. You can't over pursue any time. You've got an option quarterback and you've got an option offense. And that's something that North Carolina a team has to be careful with. Trotman again has an option man behind him. He reverses his field. Cuts it back in. Has a block up front. Still on his feet. Fumbles the football. And the Aggies have it again. On the return this time, bringing it back up the field for North Carolina a t is B.J. Little, the linebacker. B.J. Little, one of those great defensive players once again, and B.J. is a leading tackler for North Carolina a t 51 tackles on the season, and this is his second fumble recovery. As I was talking about the over-pursuing of an option quarterback, look at Troutman. He gets out on the move, but you know what? You can't carry that football around too loosely. And once again, Charlie, I talked about it at the start of the game. It's it's a technique for the Aggies. They always go for the football as well as the tackle, and B.J. Little was there to pick it up and take it downfield. So three mistakes by the Bethune-Cookman in the first quarter. have Two of them have resulted in 10 points. This is the third. Let's see if the Aggies can capitalize again, first and 10, at the Bethune 14. And if I'm not mistaken, all three have been fumbles. Yes, they have. If you want to count the, uh, the kickoff return, which was never handled, wasn't really a fumble. It was never even touched. So it was almost like an onside kick that was recovered. S something consciously goes inside your head in a situation situation like that. If I'm playing against you and I know that you are always going for the ball as well as the tackle, then I'm going to try to protect that football. But consciously, I know that it's going to happen. It was really interesting when you sit there and you watch the pregame warm-ups, and this was something that Coach was saying, work on, work on, work on. So those work ethics have turned around. Just like last week against Howard, the Aggies are capitalizing on the other team's mistakes. And right now, Bethune-Cookman is getting sick and tired of seeing the fumble come on. And here's... 
Will Smith trying to turn the corner and they get a lot of help defensively from that right side. They would not let him turn the corner or get loose. So they're keying on him a little better now. And then it brings up a second down after a loss of about one second down and 11 for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. But in defense of Patel Trotman on that run, he's trying to make something happen, of course, and he was actually stripped from behind. Defender did a great job coming over the top That's and what knocking they do. the ball down. That is down. part of that technique. They do it from behind. They're not going to let you see what they're going to do. They don't hold a big sign up there and say, hey, we're going to strip the ball. We're going to make you fumble. Well, I think no, he thought you've got to protect that football. But I think he felt he had more open field in front of him, and he didn't see the man coming from behind. And here's the quarterback battle, slipping, trying to get some footing. He's had some gold jerseys in front of him blocking, but there's a couple flags down, and the ball comes loose, but there's no fumble as the whistle has blown. And let's see what the flag is. Are we going to get holding against the Aggies, or are we going to get a face mask against Bethune? One thing we do know, this is an intense rivalry. They talk about FAMU and Bethune-Cookman. Number two clipping. has to be North Carolina A&T and Bethune-Cookman. So it's clipping, and of course, one of the big rivalries for Bethune over the years was the Rattlers of Florida and m and in-state school. Let's listen to our referee, Artie Cobb. It's a clipping penalty against the Aggies. Still explaining the options to the defensive captains for the Bethune Bookman Wildcats. Flip. This offense comes to decline. Fourth down. So they're going to decline the penalty, bring up a fourth down situation. Take a look at the footing, and Charlie, you mentioned it earlier in the game. You talked about the rain last night. You talked about the field conditions. It was High evidence right there. Game. Jason Battle was slipping and sliding all over the place. As a matter of fact, I thought he was trying to do an impersonation of James Brown. He was going to break down into a split. <laughs> so to bring up a fourth down punting situation as the Aggies are unable to capitalize scoring-wise on this turnover by the... The Thune Cookman Wildcats, so they will punt it away from their own 29 li yard line or from the 29 yard line of Bethune. Unless they have a fake punt here. Well, let's see what's going on here. Someone calls a timeout. Remember now, Bethune Cookman started the season with a win over Savannah State. Well, that's the end of the first quarter. They beat Morgan, lost to Howard, beat Mars Brown, lost to Delaware State, won their last two against Johnson C. Smith and South Carolina State. And right now, trailing 10 to nothing to the Aggies. They're going to try, as we start the second quarter, 10 to nothing, a field goal. And Dawkins is on to attempt one. This will be a 46-yard field goal attempt. He's already hit a 36-yarder, and it hits the goal post, and it is no good. Just missed. It was long enough, but it just hit the goalpost and bounced back into the field of play. So they tried a 30, 46 yard field goal, but it did not work. Almost good from 50, man. That's pretty impressive when you consider that. But there are your first half stats, Bank of America, and look at it, the rushing yard stats. Bethune Cookman has 43-16 for North Carolina A&T. But passing, you see that big zero compared to the 22? First down's a huge key, 5-1, to one, and penalties. Once again, North Carolina A&T. And, of course, there it is for Bethune Cookman. There he is, my man, Patel Dropman. And, again, the turnovers have hurt... Uh, Bethune so far in this ball game, they came into the ball game with 18 fumbles. They lost 13. They also have thrown nine interceptions. They're minus seven in the turnover or giveaway takeaway department. While the Aggies of North Carolina A&T had lost eight fumbles out of 12 and had been intercepted eight times, they were only a minus three in the takeaway giveaway department. You know, nationally, North Carolina A&T is among the tops defensively of one double-A teams. Randall Foster in the lineup at quarterback now for the bethune Bookman Wildcats. Patel Troutman might have gotten shaken up on that last time when he fumbled because he was a little slow getting up. Trying to scan the sidelines to see if he's just been taken out or if he's resting or going to the locker room. He's coming right back into the football game. Okay. He looks wide and alert, so I think he's fine. They just wanted to perhaps clear something up. Maybe they see something from the sidelines defensively that he can do a little different. 
He's taking third the shotgun down. now. Third down and ten from the shotgun. He's the only man in the backfield right now. He's back to pass, and here comes some pressure from the Aggies up front. He skips around, and he's holding the ball a little better this time, and he gets the first down out to about the 40-yard line. Let's see exactly where they mark it. Maybe they didn't get the first down. He may be a little shy. He may be a little shy getting that first down. Huh? One of the reasons why you see the excellent pursuit. It was an all-out blitz coming in for North Carolina a t was Marcus Witten. Watch him. He misses. However, he's holding on to that football, man. He said, you know what? The last time Ronnie Duncan talked about me fumbling the football, I can't afford that to happen. So they're looking at the spot. They're probably going to have to measure from the far sideline and bring the chains across. He spoke of the games in which Bethune has been involved in this year. Look at the equipment uh, being adjusted there by the trainers on Nick Rawls, the equipment people. Let's see where they, or not they get the first down. Looks like he's going to be about a half a yard shy, and it's a fourth down situation. Big decision for Alvin White. Do you punt it away? Oh, Alvin White's going for it. You know the type of personality he has. He's going for it. He's a colorful kind of a guy. He wants to win this game. So much is in this game emotionally. He goes back three years ago, 73 to 7. You know what? I wonder if the shoe was on the other foot. Would he have run up the score? There's a possibility, especially when you consider it's North Carolina A&T and Bethune Cookman. The, the, the most second most heated rivalry <laughs> arrival of the Wildcats at Bethune Cook. But you know, rivalries are good for college football and they're good for the MEAC. It brings out the fans. Folks are watching it on TV. You know, you read the paper here locally. They talk about the rivalry. Some people don't like to get involved in the whole thing, but you know what? It brings the emotion out. And football is an emotional sport. I love the fact, you know, both coaches, they speak to one another. You know what? They just simply want to win. That's all it's about. On fourth and inches. Patel Troutman has his team set. Hands off. They get the first down with plenty to spare. It may be six, but caught from behind. See, there it is again, Rogers. Charlie, and that technique. Once again, the technique of getting the tackle and stripping the football, and North Carolina a t has done it again. Jay I've Rogers. talked about it all day long. You could talk about Jay Rogers. You could talk about the Wayne Carpenter. Watch him here, number 19. Daryl Clue comes up with the football. So what I like here is that you go for the football as well as the tackle. It is Dwayne Carpenter, and that is a sweet move. He did it from the outside linebacker position. He ran him down, and when he ran him down, not only did he go for the tackle, he went for the football. It's a technique. They do it at North Carolina a t before the game, during practice, and it's paying off. They've got four fumbles today. Four. One, two, well, three, four. Not a fumble. Three turnovers. Four turnovers, three fumbles. Put it this way. They got the football four times defensively, and it always puts the offense in excellent position to score. Again, they're keeping the ball on the ground. Farmer trying to turn the corner. Hubbard has him, but he still manages to pick up three. Stumbles up to about the 2019-yard line, where it'll be second down. That man right there is saying, come on, can't we hold on to the football? We've got to stop these turnovers. These guys are going for the ball as well as the tackle. Put that baby inside of you and don't let it go. The next person who drops the football, the next person who loses the football is going to have a seat and watching the game closer to the stands on the bench. And the thing is, they gambled on fourth and inches. But going, oh, they had a big run. I mean, they really were looking good there. And then again, they get down and deep into Aggie territory all the way down to the 11-yard line, and they fumble the football. Turnovers will kill you all the time. This is a team that capitalizes on it. All you have to do is look at that game against Norfolk. We showed here, MEAC game of the week. Norfolk comes back, but what does North Carolina a t do? They cause the Spartans to turn over the ball late in the game, and they're able to hold on for the win. Bill Hayes has been in the Aggies camp for the last 12 years and there's a 10 point turnover ratio in favor of the Aggies of North Carolina a &T. 10 points off the turnover and it's still struggling it looks like they may have gotten the first down and we may have a fumble and now Bethune will able be able maybe to capitalize now they get the ball by way of a turnover Let's see if we can see what happened there. What comes around sometimes can go around. As a matter of fact, I thought the play may have been stopped. However, Bethune-Cookman was alert. 
Watch it here, Eric Farmer with the football. Where does he lose it? Yes, he never totally had the football, or at least under control. And that's what can cause it sometimes, a very shaky and bad handoff. Five turnovers in this ball game so far. Four by Bethune, one by the Aggies. You see Eric Turner? You see Cook there going for the ball. Cook was able to get the strip. Damian Cook, number 95. And all of a sudden, the turnover bug is on your side of the field. Mr. Jay, Hayes. Jay Rogers out of Deltona. He's the man back there. Troutman on the option, keeps the ball, turns it in, tries to pitch it back, and it's going to be an Aggie football. And the Aggies pick it up. And that's Carpenter again. Look at him. He looks like he's going for six. Troutman. Is it going to be on his side? But, ah, oh, he's finally down brought down. by Traron Porter. Caught from behind, so another turnover. Once again, the outside linebacker, Dwayne Carpenter, number 19, Johnny on the spot, missed alert, and we've got an official down, and it looks like Cobb is holding his shoulder. Artie Cobb, the referee, is down, and he may have gotten run over trying to, and hopefully he's okay. You see Troutman right there. See how he holds that football? Well, he's he trying to get it off, trying to get it off with the pitch. But you see the pursuit. I mean, those Aggies are like killer bees, man. They're all over you. And look at Dwayne Carpenter, number 19. He doesn't see number four behind him. He thinks he's clear and free for nothing but six on his side. But, oh, uh, got you by the legs. And that's how we can bring you down. But you've got to be concerned right now for the official. Watch it again in slow motion. Man, everybody is moving and everybody is making sure that when you get hit, I know your name and I know your number. So Artie Cobb, the referee, is uh, down. We're trying to see if we can hear you. We can probably see it right there. Artie uh, Cobb, no, we, we couldn't it. see it. Lost it there, too. Obviously, he got ran over by a player, and we just hope that he is able to, to get up and he's okay. It's, it can be a dangerous game for the officials, too, Charlie. You've done it. You know a lot of these officials. Let's face it. You've got to be alert at all times as an official. No question. I think the most dangerous position in football is the umpire. Is the umpire. Let's watch the top of your screen. Take a look at the top of your screen. Right here. Watch him right here. See, he's moving with the football, and who gets him? Oh, it's the big fella. And he goes down on the shoulder. Goes down on the shoulder. I recognize it was a shoulder right away because he was grinsing and grinsing in pain. But he looks like he's going to try to continue. He's up. He put his white hat back on. One of the other officials. Was Tell me these MEAC officials ain't tough. There's a timeout on the field. Artie Cobb comes over. He checks out his shoulder. He seems like he's okay. We'll be back. Of the fumble by the Aggies of North Carolina a &T. there's Artie Cobb. Moses Norman will take over at the referee spot right now. First down and 10 for the Aggies. Second back through. And they keep it on the ground this time. Adrian Parks out of Goldsboro, North Carolina. And he's Wayne High. Gets the carry. He had 92 yards earlier this season against Winston-Salem. Coming off the bench. Spelling doesn't, Maurice Smith. Doesn't make a difference who carries the football. That's the one thing I love about the Aggies. They continue to pound the football down your throat. Mo Smith, Adrian Parks, Eric Farmer, Jeff Neal. The names keep coming off the bench. And they keep running the ball. You know, you talk about officials getting hurt. Referee normally is the most is the safest spot on the field. The umpire has got to be the worst spot. Mo Smith trying to bounce outside, and he gets it to the one-yard line. Maurice Smith carried a couple of Bethune-Cookman Wildcats with him to the goal line, Jimmy Williams being one of them, but he didn't get it in. 6'1", 235, man, that's a massive man to bring down Mo Smith. I've enjoyed just simply watching him, especially the two times we've had him on the MEAC game of the week. You know what? When you are that big and you can be that strong and move that well, the guys who play on Sunday are looking at you. Third down and inches. They can still get a first down without scoring. That is the Aggies. Eric Farmer, the up back of the in the eye formation, the multiple eyes, they call it, and Farmer has it, and he just goes into the end zone easily, unmolested, just ran over one of the defensive secondary men. That was Joe Giddens, and he takes him into the end zone, and the Aggies increase their lead to 16 to nothing. You know, Eric Farmer said, are you kidding me, Joe Giddens? Watch here. Number 36 gets the football, and he's going to take it in. Joe Giddens, get out of my way. The end zone is my territory. So... Three turnovers, three of the five turnovers have resulted in Aggie scores so far today. And here to attempt the point after is Dawkins. 
to try to make it 17 to nothing. 10-37 remaining here in the second quarter, and it is blocked by Bethune Cookman. Coming up with the block is Antoine Robinson. So the PAT is blocked. And it remains 16 to nothing with 10.37 remaining. Fallstone Production stays at the Adams Mark Daytona Beach Resort. The Adams Mark is Daytona's premier resort with all amenities and the best variety of dining and entertainment. All rooms are oceanfront, located at 100 North Atlantic Avenue. The Adams Mark is the premier resort in Daytona Beach. A reservation, simply call 1-800-444-ADAM. Man, I enjoy that place. Every time you go to any room, they give you the best service. You know what? You get a great view. And I love the guy in the How lounge. How much they pay you? The lounge singer? No, they didn't pay me nothing. As a matter of fact, man, it's awesome. Look, if you are coming to Daytona Beach, this is the place to go. You can see the Atlantic Ocean sit out there. So romantic. Make sure you bring your great friend, your wife, whoever you want to bring with you. Have a great time. And the next time I come, I'm going to have to bring her. Because I keep telling her how beautiful they are. I keep telling her. I say, Vaughn, you got to come to this game, baby. It's, it's, it's so pretty. I'm not talking about the game. I'm talking about the Adams Mark. So Artie is uh, going to be taken possibly to uh, he is, you know what? get x-rays on you his shoulder. You know what? But he's a tough guy. See, oh, yeah. he's not having anybody hold him. He's, he's going in on his own. He reluctantly went in. See, officials are tough guys, too. See, tough guys just don't play football. And then, of course, they have play-by-play announcements like Charlie Neal. <laughs> I guess that's when you get soft, right? <laughs> no question. <laughs> don't forget for all of your information that you would like to find out about the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, you can click on to the website at www.meacsports.com. Just click on it. With 10.37 left here in the second quarter, Charlie Neal, Ronnie Duncan here, and the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats down 16 to nothing because of five fumbles in the ball game. Have the ball out at about the 17-yard line. This Toss it down to Jeff Rumlin, who has an update on our referee, Artie Cobb. Jeff? Thanks, Charlie. Referee Cobb had a slight separation between his shoulder and his collarbone. Will he return? That's still up in the air. However, he has been taken inside, has ice on his shoulder. Hopefully, he'll be able to return. Back All upstairs. Right. Thank you very much. He's gone to the avalanche. They're going to ice it down, and, of course, they uh, are going to look at it. Slight separation. You can see the way he came down, trying to trail that play. Yeah, he was grimacing in pain, holding on to his shoulder. It was obvious to me it was the shoulder, but obviously uh, we've got to get the official word in. Jeff Rumlin doing a good job down there. I tell you what, they're keeping him busy. Terry Dockman, of course, the official. And there we keep the ball on the ground. Jay Rogers again, who has a fumble of his own in the contest, gets the first down out to the 30-yard line. So Jay Rogers keeping the drive running, a 13-yard run by Rodgers and a first and 10 for Bethune-Cookman. When you talk about this rivalry, when you talk about emotions, I've got to ask you this one question, Charlie. Did you expect to see this domination so early from the Aggies, especially defensively, in lieu of what they did last week against Howard? No, Let's it's not domination, though. You got They've taken advantage of some of the opportunities that they have, but they're not, they haven't dominated the game. If you take away the five turnovers by the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats, do we have 16 points on the board. That's the thing you have to look at. Remember, out of the five, they've only scored on three of those possessions. Two, they one time they turned the ball over, and another time they missed a field goal. So that's again, a true point. But you know, it's just that I'm looking at this defense and both defensive, both yes, defenses. they've made they have made things happen. Okay, 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 they've made things happen from the defensive side of the ball, but have they done anything really to dominate the, the game? as such in terms of the offensive power. They, they really haven't done that. They've taken advantage of some opportunities that have been afforded. Put it this way, with Terry Doctor out of the game, defensively, things are not the same for Bethune Cookman. Then when you look at the simple fact that Farmer or Maurice Smith have basically been able to run wild offensively, I just see, I, I see domination right now. I see a situation where a and is looking so strong defensively and so strong offensively that if they take their time, they may be able to coast to a victory. So it brings up a second down situation. Ball at the 31-yard line. 
on the option. Here's Troutman cutting it back and diving out to the 40-yard line. Had to leap over one of his offensive linemen, Terrence Butler, there to pick up uh, close to a first down, depending on where they mark the ball. The one thing I'm seeing defensively is that North Carolina A&T has not been like clueless when it comes to Patel Troutman. And a lot of teams in the MEAC and a lot of teams that face Bethune Cookman up. I mean, let's face it, there's so many wrinkles, so many steps, so many different options in this offense. The Wyatt Bone. Do you remember a year ago, Troutman ran for over 1,000 yards. He was the second leading rusher and scorer in the MEAC from his quarterback spot. And there's a timeout on the field. Bethune Cookman calls this one. 844 left second quarter. They trail it 16 to nothing. And then Florida and M's women won their respective titles in the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference Cross Country Championships today. Up in Greensboro, Bethune was led by Joseph Langett, who set an MEAC record of 25-39 to finish first. The Wildcats had 45 team points. And FAMU's ladies won its third straight title with 28 points. The top female finisher was from Norfolk State, Eva Lestisov at 19-13. So congratulations to both the women and men. Women from Florida and m the men from the school, the women in the cross-country championship. And Rogers again gets the first down, and he's out across the 45 to about the 48-yard line. It'll be first and 10, Bethune-Cookman. They have moved the ball. They have done a good job of taking it down the field. The thing is, they've turned the ball over. And if they can just protect the ball, they're right back in this ball game. But uh, you don't want to have to play catch-up against a team like the Aggies. There's Jay Rogers. Rogers out of... Pine Ridge High in Deltona, Florida. And again, he has in the secondary, and he has another first down inside the Aggie territory at about the 37, 38-yard line. The business administration major came into today's game. Jay Rogers, there you see the stats on him. Five yards per carry, 427 yards. He was the first rookie a year ago in the school's history to have 200 yards in a ball game. At 221 against Dell State, he has the ball again, and he doesn't get much going that time. They went with a full house backfield. Ray Massey was one of the guys who put the stop on them. You know, interesting numbers for North Carolina A&T when you consider conference opponents in the MEAC. They beat Howard last week, what, 51 to nothing. They beat Morgan State, Norfolk, Hampton. They have outscored MEAC opponents, including today, get this, 166 to 44. Right. I mean, that's a defense that has proven that when time comes up to stop people, they do it. And they've done it effectively so far today. Sure, you've seen some of the here and there. Trotman back to pass, has it complete. And we have a first down to Curtis Williams. So Curtis Williams comes up with the reception, his seventh of the year. And we have a first down for Bethune. You're speaking of those. Uh, particular scores they had 28 points against Norfolk 41 against Hampton 30 against Morgan 51 against Howard I mean yeah that uh, those are teams and I even asked coach Hayes I said were you surprised at how well you manhandled Howard a week ago he said yes I am he, said, oh, he was really? honest about it yes. too because of the simple fact he will tell you they just simply played on all cylinders they had every aspect of their game working extremely well and as a coach you know Charlie you don't get opportunities like that often where every part of your game is basically clicking. clicking. All the cylinders. You know? That's right. I mean, it, it, you know, and we hear coaches say it all the time, that football is a three-part game. It's offense, defense, and it's special teams. It's you have to have all three clicking on the same page, on the same cylinder, in order for it to be effective. It is second down. We'll call it eight. 6.35 left second quarter. 16 to nothing. A&T, but Thune driving. They moved into Aggie territory. Jeremy Thomas, the play action. Here's Patel Troutman trying to get loose. Still on his feet. Needs a block. Gets one. Has some running room. Now he throws it into the end zone. But it's out of the end zone. And it's going to be incomplete even if it is caught. Down there by the intended receiver, Curtis. Williams. All that running has got some very tired offensive linemen. You talk about guys that were trying to force off those blocks, and they were doing it effectively for the Bethune-Cookman. Oh, my goodness, man. I mean, you, you see Patel Troutman. He's running around like a madman possessed out there, but he's still able to get off the football, and he almost, almost, Jolly, was able to happen for a touchdown. So 
on third down. We're going to see another quarterback in That's the lineup for the Wildcats of Bethune Cookman. Number 10 is in the lineup right now, Taji Parrish. And he's really not a quarterback. Taji Parrish is actually a kicker who they uh, move around and let him do a little bit of everything. He hasn't played that quarterback this year. 6-12, the time remaining. He's the third stringer, and he's in there now. Quarterbacks in today's game, Jason Battle. There is the quarterback comparison stats presented by U.S. Airways. Two of two for Battle, 22 yards, no touchdowns and an interception. And Patel Trotman, one of four, 16 yards. He's also rushed for 29 yards. And Taji Parrish, who's in the lineup right now, has not... Uh, thrown but one pass this year that was incomplete now Troutman's back in there so and let's look at the third down conversion of today's game uh, Bethune Cookman two of five big third down facing him now third and about eight and here's Patel Troutman stands in there throws has it complete and out of bounds let's see if he got the first down Eric Lash from the reception but I think he's going to be way short of a first down by about a yard and a half so you've got to, as a receiver, know where that first down mark is. You've got to get there and give your quarterback and your team an opportunity to pick up the first down. Going to Lash, who happens to be the speed receiver once again. Troutman trying to make something happen. He sees Lash there, but Lash doesn't quite get a good view of that first down mark. And the reason why, he's taken to his back. He's a freshman. They say he may be the fastest person on this team, Eric Lash. He's a freshman out of Springfield, Florida, redshirt freshman from Rutherford High. He was a runner-up. That is his team in the Class 5A title a year ago or two years ago. He didn't play a year ago. Considering that down 16 to nothing, there's a possibility they will be going for it. Well, they went for it a little deeper in their territory and picked up the first down with plenty to spare. Let's see. It is shy by inches. Well, you see how far they have to go to get the first down. Bethune Cookman started the season with a win over Savannah State by 17-14. Mathis hit a big field goal with 40 with 604 left in the game. They beat Morgan 28-25. It was an onside kick. We did that game here at uh, Williams' return for a touchdown. They lost to Howard 31-27 in a game they led by 17 points, but they gave up three touchdown passes to Bobby Townsend and the Howard Bisons in the fourth quarter. Beat Morris Ground 28-6. In fact, that game had no scoring until the fourth quarter. Trotman ran for 113 yards and a touchdown in that contest. Right now, they're facing a fourth down and inches right outside the 10-yard line of the Aggies. Patel Troutman has the team set. Is Jeremy Thomas the third back set behind him? Troutman on the keeper. It's going to be close. He slipped as he was trying to get his footing. The referee signals first down. See where they spot the ball. That is close. Referee signals first down. So Patel Troutman, who had trouble getting his footing after the ball was snapped, managed to get enough to get of a surge to get uh, the ball closer to the first down marker and pick up the first down. So first down and 10, ball resting right outside the 10-yard line for Bethune-Cookman. Actually, they're going to call it first and goal, maybe. They're going to have to score to pick up a first down. Jeremy Thomas, nothing going on there as he tripped over. Looks like the uh, right guard, Terrence Butler, as he was trying to, to get going. Again, the footing has not been the greatest for the running backs in extreme cutting situations. Now, Antonio Stanley is in the game. There's a young man out of Jackson High in Miami. Pitches it back. Nothing going on as they try to turn the corner. And Marcus Goggins was the man who got the call out of Columbia's High in Lake City, Florida. He's only played in four games this year and only the fourth time they've given him the ball. 
We have an injured Aggie down on the field. Trump almost lost that snap right there. And he's clutching his knee, and you can see it right there. They are twisting Patel Troutman's knee. He's had serious knee problems all year long, and he's had to deal with that pain. So we have an Aggie that's down. To finish a little further what the Bethune did to get here, we talked about the Morris Brown game. They lost to Delaware State, and that's another game that we talked about Dell State doing so well in the conference. 43-29, Foster came into that game. Randall Foster threw for 184 yards, but De uh, Delaware State's Graylin King had 127 yards and a touchdown. They beat Johnson C. Smith 26-6. Again, no scoring until the fourth quarter. They have had a couple games this year, but there's been no scoring until the fourth quarter. As you look at Lynn Relliford, who uh, leads the team in sacks with six. Yeah, he's being a huge off. Now, now, if this is serious, this is huge for them. The reason why, when you talk about tackles for loss, 11, a total of 59 yards. This big guy, let's face it, one of the better defensive ends in the MEAC with those six sacks. And you know, when you talk about, you know, they don't have a lot of guys at the top of categories as far as, you know, defensive stats, right. I mean, among the top. But as a team, they that's where out. they are the most impressive. Right. They spread them out. Relaford is second in the conference in sacks, fourth in tackles for loss. Eleven of those, six of them have been sacks. Two quarterback hurries, a fumble recovery. He's broken up five passes. He's out of Tampa Florida as a sophomore. Then, of course, we know that Bethune... Uh, Beat South Carolina State 20 to 30 to 27 the last game that they played. Led 20 to 7 at the half. Trailed in the third quarter, but scored the last 10 points. And Mathis hit a field goal with no time left on the clock. From the shotgun. On third down, Trotman throws into the end zone. Out of the end zone, or they call it touchdown. One Antonio touchdown. Stanley. Antonio Stanley got his foot down just all he needed to get it in. It was a third down and goal to go from the 13. So it's a 13-yard pass from Troutman to Stanley. Troutman out of the shotgun, and he is looking for Antonio Stanley all the way. And watch what Stanley does. He comes back to the football. See that? Excellent concentration. Able to kick the foot in bounds. Got that one foot in. That's all he needs. That's all he needed. And on for the point after is the young man, Danny Mathis. Danny saved the game against South Carolina State. And this kick is up, and it is no good. Off to the left. So, Mr. Automatic, Danny Mathis, that's the first point after touchdown he has missed this season. He was 20 for 20. Somebody may have got one. their hands on that football, Charlie. Watch it again right here. You will see a yellow jersey go up extremely oh, high. Pass. This is a touchdown. This is the touchdown pass. Okay, now we see, of course, Antonio Stanley. Nice, of course, keeping it. But you know what? I think somebody got their hands on that football that caused it to go over. Because let's face it, he is Mr. Automatic. You know, there he is, Coach Wyatt. You that know, you got to be happy, Coach. You're only down 10 points right now. That was an 83-yard drive. And as I said, the first PAT missed by Mathis this year, he was perfect. He led the conference. As you look at the ambulance, it's uh, Artie Cobb is uh, a part of right now. But anyway, uh, he led the conference coming into today's game as the leading PAT kicker in the MEAC, 20 of 20. He's also second in field goals, 7 of 11. So his first miss of the season. You know, we see that ambulance. I hope it's nothing so serious as far as uh, Relaford is concerned because that's a major loss for the Aggies of North Carolina a &T. Both teams have suffered injuries. Even the official <laughs> officiating crew has suffered an injury. They say football is a game of pain, and everyone has to have their games. Let's look at the Greyhound scoring drive. Troutman drove his team 83 yards, a 537 drive, and a 14 play situation and a 13-yard reception by Antonio Stanley. And for Antonio Stanley, Stanley. That is his third reception of a touchdown this year. On the return for the Aggies. Bringing it back up the field is Blakeney. And Blakeney is dropped before he can get loose, shy of the 15 yard line. So the uh, Bethune Cookman defense, again, we, we talked about the fact that the Aggies have a lot of points on the board, but again, a lot of it was given to them. 
by way of turnovers by Bethune Cookman. I'll tell you what, your point has been well made. As a matter of fact, I had Bethune Cookman sitting in a situation perhaps where they wouldn't be able to score maybe in the first half, but it was a successful drive by Patel Trout. You saw it right there on our Greyhound scoring drive, and he was able to move his team and got a go-to guy to get back to the game, and that's Antonio Stanley. What I liked about that pattern that Antonio Stanley ran, he basically outran his man, turned around with his back to the, the ball. ball and caught the ball. We have a penalty flag down. We're in the second quarter. 16 to 6 is our score. We've had a little bit of everything as you look at uh, what happened here. May have been a legal procedure against or offsides. Let's see. Is it offsides against the defense? No, it's a legal procedure against the offense. Get halftime coming up. Both bands are here. Of course, the Aggies of North Carolina A&T, they brought their band all the way from Greensboro and Bethune-Cookman, and we also have some high school bands in attendance. So uh, quite a good crowd on hand here at Municipal Stadium in Daytona Beach. First and 15 now for the Aggies, leading it 16 to 6. 435 remaining in the first half. Keeping the ball on the ground, and there he is into the secondary and gaining about 10 or 12 of the yards back is Maurice Smith. And that was Lawrence or Rawls actually who made the stop defensively. Second down and about six or make it second and four. Second down four for North Carolina A&T. Aggies for years under Bill Hayes, a wing T. They've gone to that multiple eye now and it's worked. Here's Mo Smith. Foot in the backfield, submarine by Hubbard, who was the first man to hit him out of Sarasota. Young man who had off-season knee surgery. And that's another tackle for loss for him, his seventh of the year, dropping the opponent behind the line of scrimmage for negative yards. So to bring up a third down. happening again for the Aggies offensively as Desmond Adams was stopped by Rod Smith out of Mainland High in Daytona Beach a red shirt senior so to bring up a fourth down and Bethune will have another opportunity to get on the board before halftime so this man rush started at their the own 20 is stymied right at about the 28 yard line 27. Smith getting into the backfield part of that four-man rush and they are penetrating right through the offensive line of the Aggies and again Anthony Moore with the punt this one is fielded Rashawn Matthew Mathis and Mathis gets it back to about the 33 34 yard line and that's where they will go to work Bethune trailing by 10 but they have the ball we'll be back in the second quarter with 241 remaining and the Aggies leading and coming up at halftime our Ronnie Duncan goes inside the NFL Hall of Fame in Canton Ohio and talks about some of the greats that played their collegiate ball right here in the MEAC all coming up at halftime you want to be with us for that and of course we'll get a chance to see the Bethune band and possibly even a taste of A&T they have their band here also today. So the Bethune Cookman Wildcats starting at their own 34 yard line, trailing by 10, but they have the ball first down and 10. Here in the second quarter, Trotman under pressure will not get away. He was brought down by Robert Williams immediately, right there on the tackle out of Birdie High in Windsor, North Carolina. Once again, it's that excellent pursuit of defense, and when you are a defensive lineman, like the big fella you see right there, he will tell you, you got to back that thing on up. Robert Williams out of Windsor, North Carolina. Didn't play a year ago because of an injury. Had five sacks two seasons ago as a freshman. Has three sacks this year. Add another one to that one. Second down, Troutman on the option, trying to spin out, gets into the secondary, tries to turn the corner, great open field tackle by, uh, let's see, who made that tackle? Tramel Perkins. Perkins, Tramel Perkett, rather, out of Plymouth, North Carolina, moved from a running back spot, 
was uh, quite a bit quite a good running back for the Aggies at one point. You know what I like about this? You see that it was an all-out blitz, and that's what can happen sometimes against a very talented option quarterback. But look at Perquette, the open field tackle, taking the legs of a talented play. And going for the first down and getting the reception right at about the 45-yard line should be enough for the first down is, let's see, Hubbard, Tarian Hubbard out of St. Petersburg, Florida, St. Pete High, seventh reception of the year, and he does pick up the first down for the Wildcats. Off from the shotgun, Trotman working. There's a timing rock right there, and the reason why it was a simple drop. All he did was just simply go back, and he knew exactly where his receiver was supposed to be, and Hubbard was there for the reception. Antonio Stanley in the lineup, in the slot, has a touchdown for the Wildcats so far. From the shotgun again, Trotman works, and he looks like he wants to pitch to Stanley, but Stanley was not there, and he decided to turn it up, and I think that would have to say that the defense of North Carolina a and led by B.J. Little, did a great job of reading that option play and staying and focusing and shadowing Patel Trotman, not letting him uh, lose. Well, that's something exactly what happened there because Stanley didn't read the play as well as everyone would have anticipated, but B.J. Little and that linebacker, of course, see, they're going to be busy today because they've got to stop a guy who is an option quarterback who can throw the ball as well. They're getting his hand on the ball. The big fella, number 93. I'm talking Marco McGee. And they tap it in the air, so uh, bring up a third down, 12-yard situation. Another quarterback coming in. Taji Parrish will come into the lineup. Remember, he's only thrown one pass all year. You see, I see the big fella, number 93, going right upside the head. But see, there he is. Boom, baby, boom. Big fella can jump and even shake the room. Marco McGee, number 93. Taji Parrish may have a stronger arm than Trotman, and he's trying to get loose, trying to get to the first down marker. Will be way short by about six yards. Just manages to get close to the midfield stripe with 37 seconds to go in the first half. Off the Williams took him down, and off the Williams helps to bring him up, number 54. Yes, he's playing that same Willie linebacker position with Ray Massey. Fourth down. Bethune has used two timeouts already in this half. And I believe this is going to be an Aggie timeout with 18 seconds to go. Now, do the Aggies or the Aggies have to be thinking that maybe Bethune uh, will punt the ball to him? Maybe we'll set up a return. But if I'm Alvin Wyatt, I'd, I'd put it up and at least go for one uh, last play before the half. Well, you're successful the last time they had the football in their drive, and they could do it again. Let's face it, if anyone needs a score right now, it's Bethune-Cookman. And it is fourth down. Fourth down facing the Wildcats of Bethune-Cookman, trailing by 10. Remember, they all the scoring has resulted, that is, as far as uh, the Aggies are concerned. And they're trying to get the game clock, I think, reset. All the Aggies scoring the 16 points that they have on the board as a result of three turnovers by Bethune-Cookman. Actually, they've had five, but they've been able to capitalize on three of them. With 6.20 left in the first quarter, Bethune fumbled. Aggies took it in on a Smith 37-yard run. Then on the ensuing kickoff, they didn't get to the football. That is Bethune-Cookman. The Aggies recovered, and then uh, Dawkins kicks a 37-yard field goal, and it's 10 to nothing. And then the second, the third, and fourth fumble, they were unable to capitalize. That is North Carolina A&T. But then uh, in the second quarter with 11-20 left, again a fumble. And uh, Farmer with a one-yard run made it 16 to nothing. Patel Troutman. 13-yard pass to Stanley, and that's how Bethune got on the board. Don't forget the Heritage Bowl coming up December 18th in Atlanta. The MIAC champion for the most part, and that's where everybody wants to go. Uh, going against the SWAC, and of course the SWAC will not have anybody in the 1AA playoffs, although this basically is look, you know, teams are looking at that Heritage Bowl as well as the 1AA playoffs. It'll be between Florida and m and North Carolina and t right now as we get a delay a game as to which team will represent the conference in the 1AA playoff and who will go to the Heritage Bowl. 
A year ago, this is where A&T wanted to be, the Heritage Bowl, had their sights set until Bethune came to town. Bethune knocked them off on homecoming, 34-27 in overtime, a game in which A&T had a commanding lead. Going to run away. Not a good kick. And it goes out of bounds. Not a good kick by Jody Spear. I don't know what they were trying to do. <laughs> he comes to the sideline. He looks over to Alvin Wyatt. They lost yards. <laughs> oh, no, on the Did you see the look that Coach Wyatt gave him? He was like, don't even come over here. Looks like they lost yards on the punt. Look, he's given a demonstration as to what he was supposed to do. You know, the thing about it, he's animated. He loves his kids. He's only trying to get the very best out of them. That's Coach Alvin Wyatt. You know what? 16-6 to six in the second half is going to be quite interesting. If I were you, I'd stick around. Intercepted. The Phil Cookman has an interception. Another turnover. This is Giddens. And Giddens gets out of bounds and stops the clock with four seconds to go. So Joe Giddens with his third interception of the year. Six of the team's ten interceptions prior to today's game have been between Lawrence, Giddens, and Mathis. And Giddens, they each had two. Giddens That's when picks you get up his greedy. third. That's when you get greedy. No need to pass the ball with 22 seconds left to go on the clock. Take a knee and go into halftime. Here now you're putting yourself in a situation where Bethune-Cookman can come right back and score with four seconds left to go anytime a dangerous guy like Troutman's on the field. Watch it here, the interception, and I tell you what, what he did that was so smart was run out of bounds with a little time to possibly score. So he goes out of bounds, and Bethune gets the ball. I mean, this is going to be... They've got six wide receivers in this game right now. And a flag is going to be down. This is going to be a Hail Mary into the end zone. And it's intercepted in the end zone. But let's see. It's a deep, the penalty is on the offensive team. It's not going to be a defensive penalty. So we're going to have an illegal formation. So, again, that'll end the first half. It'll be declined by the Aggies. And that's going to end the first half. That's actually technically a turnover. 6-1 <laughs> for the uh, Bethune-Cookman Wildcats today. First interception. No time left. Tell you what, it's been an interesting game in the first half when you consider the score 16 to 6. You've seen Troutman generate the offense late in the second quarter of this game. But of course, turnovers have been the thing that have hurt every team that plays against the Aggies because the Aggies will capitalize on that mistake. Once again, you see all the folks getting ready to ban is getting ready to pump you up and play for you at halftime. We've got a feature where I go to the Pro Football Hall of Fame and we find out exactly who were some of the first African-Americans inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame and you will be surprised the representation that you will see from the MEAC and its schools and representatives. All right, Bill Hayes, uh, his team leading 16 to 6, and he's with our Jeff Rumlin on the sideline right now. Jeff. Down here, Coach, you have five turnovers here in the first half. You lead 16 to 6. How do you see the first half so far? We were a little sloppy in the first half, but we were able to hang on. That's the key thing. I thought our defense made some huge plays to put the offense in position. We've got to play better, and we've got to tackle a lot better. And, Coach, it's obvious that your defense players go for the ball. Do you teach that each day in practice? Every day in practice we teach uh, scoop drills, fumbles, and things like that. All right, Coach. Hey, go with the Aggies. All right. We'll see you. Charlie, back <laughs> up to you. <laughs> All right. Coach is making Team. me look good up here. You know that? Team leading by 10. We're at halftime here in Daytona. We'll be back. Somehow we've been able to institutionally capture that magnificent interface between the strong liberal arts tradition and the high-tech mode to produce the place where dreamers become achievers, from astronauts to presidents. North Carolina A&T State University, where the best get better. At halftime and down on the field, a marching machine from North Carolina a &T. Let's go down and take a listen.
The North Carolina NT Aggies marching machine here in Daytona Beach. Their team leading 16 to 6 at halftime. And a number of our players who play collegiate football here in the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference are now members of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And our Ronnie Duncan had a chance to visit and update us on those members. It is the home of greatness and the home of the best. The Pro Football in Canton, Ohio. And the MEAC is well represented in the home that enshrines football's greatest stars. And football fans from throughout the world make this pilgrimage to Canton, Ohio, each year to take a look. Joe Corrigan is one of the executives of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. When you talk about any Hall of Fame, they're, they're usually people who have had success throughout their life that got them to the final step, at least in their professional career. Uh, these aren't people who were handed things. They, they were people that worked and worked hard and excelled at what they did. And that is the true essence of the emergence of the African-American athlete and professional sports in the modern-day era as we know it today. And back in 1946, Bill Willis, along with Marion Motley, who at one time went to South Carolina State, became the first two African-Americans to play professional football in the United States a year before Jackie Robinson ever donned a uniform with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Marion, as I mentioned, uh, uh, broke the color barrier along with Bill Willis, uh, who played at Ohio State, uh, in the All-America Football Conference. Uh, concurrently, we had over with the Los Angeles Rams, we had Woody Strode and Kenny Washington. But Marion and Bill were the first two to really become outstanding athletes or professional athletes and stay for a long extended period of time. Motley played most of his career with the Cleveland Browns wearing number 76. But he was also a first at the Hall of Fame as the first African American ever inducted. Uh, Marion came in in 1968 and uh, uh, it's just one of his many firsts. One of the newest exhibits here at the Hall of Fame is one that is honoring African American athletes and how they started in pro football. Well, that exhibit we actually created in its original form back in 1978, but about two, three years ago, we, we redid it, just gave it a, a different look. It kind of got dated in the sense of its, uh, of its technique. But it was really our attempt to show that the black athlete, while it was very sparsely represented in, in professional football from its, from its birth in 1892, really until the uh, 60s, uh, it was our attempt to show that chronology. We're not making any statement as to what and why it happened so much as the fact that it did happen. However, we do know this. The MEAC is proud of its contributions to the development of African Americans in pro football as well as the Hall of Fame. Morgan State has Roosevelt Brown, Lynn Ford, Willie Lanier, and Leroy Kelly all in the hall. Bethune-Cookman has Larry Little. South Carolina State has Marion Motley and Deacon Jones. And finally, Art Shell, the first African-American to coach in the modern-day era, is there as a player with the Oakland and Los Angeles Raiders, and he's a proud product of Maryland Eastern Shore. That's seven players from MEAC schools in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And consider this. Only 199 players, coaches, and contributors are in the hall, and the MEAC has seven, and the first two men of color to be named there. The first thing that comes to mind when I think of the Len Fords and the Marion Motleys, and even later uh, when we start getting into some of the uh, uh, players that came in the 60s, is that there were rival leagues to the National Football League at that time that helped bring opportunity, uh, specifically the All-America Football Conference in the 40s, uh, enabled Paul Brown to bring in black players to that league. At the same time, the National Football League, more under pressure, reacted uh, and allowed black players to play with the Los Angeles Rams. But Marion came in 1946, breaking color, the color barrier a year before baseball did it with Jackie Robinson. Uh, Len Ford came in 48 with the Los Angeles Dons. Len was in All-America, and I don't even know that he was drafted in the National Football League. But one thing we do know, he played in the MEAC. Ronnie Duncan, reporting. They have 
made their mark. MEAC players in the Hall of Fame. We're at halftime, and the Aggies lead it by 10, 16 to 6. Time score, the Aggies of North Carolina A&T leading the Wildcats of Bethune-Cookman. We're at halftime. Charlie Neal along with Ronnie Duncan. And, Ronnie, when you look at this first half, kind of a strange kind of a ball game. When you look at the fact that Bethune-Cookman has turned the ball over six times in the first half and still only trailed by 10 points against a team who put up 51 points last week against Howard. Once again, it's indicative of that great Aggies defense, but it's been the turnover. Coach Billy Hayes talked about it. He said, you know what? We go for the football, and you can see it. It's in bold print. Six turnovers for Bethune-Cookman, just two for North Carolina A&T, but time possession it's been all about A&T, but not by much, only by about a minute. But rushing yards, 42, you'd expect them to have the edge there in the passing, in rushing. And the reason why I say that is because 172 rushing, 42 passing, Bethune-Cookman, they're starting to generate that offense, and that could cause some big problems for A&T down the stretch. All right, let's go down on the field now where the Bethune-Cookman College Marching Band is performing for us at halftime. Let's take a listen. HRG helped. Halftime score, Aggies over Bethune-Cookman College. Charlie Neal along with Ronnie Duncan. And Ronnie, uh, quite an interesting first half. We talked about the six turnovers by uh, Bethune-Cookman College. A&T had two of their own, but they are, that is, A&T was able to capitalize on three of those six turnovers and put some points on the board. Well, one of the ways they put points on the board is with the running game. Take a look at the highlights because when you talk about Maurice Smith, we've seen this guy go. I mean, he is simply awesome. Watch him here taking in for the touchdown. Charlie, that's 37 yards. And when you're that big and you're that good, that's just simply awesome. And then you want to see somebody take somebody to the end zone watch mr farmer see you can't block me i have the end zone and before you knew it but here's Troutman going to antonio stanley yes he's missed the excitement antonio stanley looked more like a baseball player catching a fly but he catches it for the touchdown and of course here's the big hit on the official and i tell you what man you hate to see that go down so you've got like two players now we've got an official down but we've got a score of 16 to 6 for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. More of the MEAC Game of the Week after this. I leave you a responsibility for young people. Bethune-Cookman College is an enlightening educational journey which inspires young men and women to succeed. For nearly a century, this private United Methodist College has maintained an international reputation for academic excellence and moral leadership. Its modern campus and facilities provide students unparalleled opportunities for learning. Bright futures begin at Bethune-Cookman College. Football at its best with hard-hitting non-stop action. From Tallahassee, Florida to Washington, D.C., MEAC football in 1999 will keep you on the edge of your seat with the stars of tomorrow today. The MEAC invites you to join us next week in the nation's capital as the Howard University Bison celebrate homecoming by hosting the Bulldogs of South Carolina State. Check your local listings for time and station. Halftime score will be back. Third quarter action from Bethune Cookman in just a moment. I At Municipal Stadium in Daytona Beach, where Bethune Cookman hosting the Aggies of North Carolina AT, and the Aggies are trailing 16 to 6 as we start the third quarter. They'll be kicking off there in their gold jerseys and blue pants and be moving right to left. Some of the crowd on hand here in Municipal Stadium. Let's go down to our sideline reporter, Jeff Rumlin, who has some updates for us. Jeff. Charlie, on the injury front, referee Artie Cobb will not return. For Bethune-Cookman, Patel Trotman got knocked around a little bit. However, Coach Wyatt said he will return. He's ready to go. One key note, Coach Wyatt said we moved the ball extremely well in the first half. However, we turned the ball over. 
If we don't turn the ball over, we're winning this game. Back upstairs. All right. Well, that's quite evident. If you have six turnovers and you're still only down by 10 points, that you could still be in this ball game. Just in case you joined us to recap the scoring, Smith 37-yard run made it seven to nothing Aggies. Then Dawkins with a 37-yard field goal made it 10 to nothing. Farmers one-yard run, and the extra point was blocked. It was 16 to nothing Aggies. All results of miscues by the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats. Troutman got his team on the board. 449 left in the second quarter with a 13-yard pass to Antonio Stanley. And that's the way we are here as we start the third quarter. Bringing the ball out for Bethune-Cookman and not much running room for him as that's Oscar Counts coming back on the re return. Was that Counts or was that 23 there? Yep, it is Counts. Oscar Counts. Moses Norman is the referee. Bruce shoulder for Artie Cobb. Who started out at the referee position, so he will not return. But the Wildcats of Bethune-Cookman have the ball first down and 10 at their own 12. Started to show some life and holding on to the football just before halftime. The deepest penetration they had other than a touchdown was to the Aggie 15-yard line. Patel Troutman keeps the ball across the 10, 15 to about the 16 yard line. A gain of three, second down and seven. The quarterback coach at North Carolina ENT, ironically enough, is a former quarterback here at Bethune Cookman, J.D. Hall, and he's sitting in the booth right next to us. He still holds a couple of MEAC records when he played here at Bethune Cookman. Again, they keep the ball on the ground. Jeremy Thomas cutting back, and he is brought down. Good tackle. Here's Jeremy Thomas. Sammy Rogers goes out. He's the one that made the last tackle for an equipment repair. He'll replace, be replaced in the lineup by Jermaine Heinsohn for the Aggies of North Carolina ENT. Now there's some discussion. Bill Hayes is out on the field talking with his defense. I didn't see anyone take a timeout. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. Alvin Wyatt is beside himself and he's discussing things with Todd Reese the headline or the line judge on the near sideline. So I still have no idea what that whole discussion situation was about but we're rolling now. First down. First down and 10. Ball out across the 22. About the 23 yard line. Jeremy Thomas on the carry, but a flag is going to be down. We may have illegal procedure against Bethune Cookman, and that'll nullify that good run. If it is illegal procedure, it may be offsides against the defense. Two people moving at the same time. We have illegal procedure. No, it's offsides. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. Trying to get the, the signals from Moses Norman. On the defense, decline, first down. So the penalty is declined. It was offsides against the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. It is first down and 10 for the... Bethune-Cookman Wildcats at the 36-yard line. Jeremy Thomas still behind the quarterback. And Thomas has the football, goes straight ahead, picks up about two or three, out to about the 38-yard line. That'll bring up a second down and seven again. So there's Jeremy Thomas, who's getting a quite a bit of a load today as far as carrying the ball between him and Jay Rogers.
Troutman back to pass. Throws. And it is caught for first down. All the way up into Bethune-Cookman territory is Terrian Hubbard, the redshirt sophomore out of St. Petersburg, Florida. So it was a great catch with a man draped all over him. And the man that was draped all over him was Darrell Clue. And he couldn't believe that the man came up with the catch. Darrell Clue was there to perhaps try to strip that football. Once again, it's that technique that Coach Hayes said they've been working on the entire season. And obviously, it's pays some dividends today. On the option, Troutman cuts it back inside. Jeremy Thomas was stood up in the hole. It's a good thing he didn't hand the ball to him. Sean Paylor was able to slow him down, especially coming in from his position, from the right defensive end position. Slow down, Troutman. When it comes to sacks, the Aggies of North Carolina A&T lead the MEAC, averaging 3.5, second and first downs allowed. And there's the third down conversion you see there. Here we go. Again, Jeremy Thomas, the same type of play that would have stood him up before, stood him up this time. Robert Williams leading the charge for the Aggies defensively, and he's got some help down there from B.J. Little. Tell you what, that time Robert got off the ball so quickly that he didn't even have time to respond. All he did was wrap his man up, and it was nothing like a loss for a game. Third, third down situation. Here we go, the Aggies today, one of six. Bethune, four of nine in third down conversions. They came in with a 34% ratio. Antonio Stanley is in there from the shotgun. Trotman, side arms, it, and it's caught. Inside the 30, Stanley still on his feet and finally run out of bounds at about the 20-yard line. Antonio Stanley who a lot of people didn't think would play today. He has a touchdown reception of 13 yards, and he picks up another reception on this play for first down. Antonio Stanley shows you his athleticism, and what he did on this play is that he came back to the football, got to the softest spot of the zone, was able to catch on, and this is what he can do with the football. Move. I'm talking about run without the football. They call him Mr. Excitement because he can definitely make things happen. He has a junior from Miami, Florida. Major education, but he's teaching a lesson on you can't catch me right now. Leroy, uh, Jeremy Thomas again trying to get the running game going. And again, it was Robert Williams there to make sure he didn't get too far. Gain of one. Stopped at about the 19. Second down nine. We're in the third quarter. 10-20. The time remaining. Bill Cookman moving the ball extremely well. They've mixed it up a lot, be it with the option, be it with the straight drop of Patel Troutman. And he's going to his receivers. He's finding the open opportunities. Right now, obviously, the run is something that North Carolina a t has been able to stop with some efficiency. However, anytime Patel Troutman is moving and grooving the way he's done right now, look out. And he keeps the ball on the option and nothing doing for him that time as Sammy Rogers out of Jacksonville High in Jacksonville, North Carolina, came up to make the stop. And this is a Bethune-Cookman team, Ronnie, that a year ago was third in the NBAC in scoring offense, second in run offense, uh, number four in total offense with the Wyatt Bone. They averaged 229 yards rushing per contest a year ago. This year, not much behind that, about 204. And the difference is, again, Patel Trotman, I think, had a little more protection a year ago. And I think they surprised some people a year ago. They're not sneaking up on people like they did in 1998. Trotman doesn't like what he sees defensively. He's going to call a timeout. 9-19 remaining third quarter. 16-6. The Aggies still on top by 10 over Bethune in Daytona. Third quarter. A year ago, the MEAC sent three teams to the postseason. Hampton and Florida a and went to the 1AA playoff, while Bethune represented the conference in the Heritage Bowl, where they lost to Southern 28-2. In fact, only trailed 7-2 at the half in that particular contest, but uh, wound up losing eventually. So we tell Troutman, as Antonio Stanley moving to a wing to the left side, on the shotgun, rolls left, looking, has some running room down the middle, takes off. He's at the five, cuts it outside and knocked out of bounds at about the one yard line where to be first and goal Bethune Cookman College finally run out of bounds I believe that was uh, Von Keith Spencer who ran him out 
Once again, he's a dangerous weapon. Anytime he has the football in his hands, he reads that defense extremely well. He sees that gaping hole, and he says, you know what? There's a possibility I can go inside and maybe even get a touchdown. But you know what? He may have hurt himself on this play, and as a matter of fact, he is coming off to the sideline. Look at him, limping on that knee, but tell Troutman. Now, if he goes out of this game, despite the fact they could easily score on this possession, it will be a costly one for the Wildcats of Bethune Cook. Randall Foster in the lineup. We've seen him a little earlier. He's a transfer from Northern Illinois University from Ypsilanti, Michigan. Had to play this year for Trotman, who's been injured on a numerous, uh, on numerous occasions. He's the number nine pass in the MEAC and could be, a lot of people feel, maybe the best backup in the conference beside Quinn Gray over at Florida A&M. You know, they've got several people around Patel right now, and it doesn't look good for this knee. This young man had knee surgery over the offseason, and uh, let's hope it's nothing serious because this will be a devastating loss. Jeremy Thomas is in the wide bone, the third back back there. They put a linebacker up there as a blocking back. They also have up there Fillmore Wester. And they give to Jeremy Thomas, who doesn't get in, or does he? Yes, yeah, he gets a signal hit. from the official. And Jeremy Thomas scores from one yard out. And that is his fourth rushing touchdown this season. And it makes it a 16 to 12 ball game. So Bethune, despite six turnovers in the first half, right back in it right now. Most definitely 12 unanswered points. And watch him here. I mean, he gets it to that end zone. And you know why he does it? Moving them legs. Never stop it until that official puts those hands up. And he says, you know what? They have six on their side. So here in the third quarter, the point after, which was missed earlier, is missed again by Danny Mathis. Remember, coming into today's game, he was a perfect 20 for 20 and point after touchdowns. But he has missed two in this ball game. And instead of it being a 16 to 14 ball game, it is 16 to 12 with 9.05 remaining here in the third quarter. Four-point advantage right now. And it's a situation in which they have scored 12 unanswered points. And Charlie, as you said it best, they could have easily scored 14 unanswered points. And what has to happen is that Billy Hayes has to be saying to himself, what has gone wrong? All of a sudden, we're not moving the football with any efficiency. All of a sudden, we're not stopping the football with any efficiency. And it goes right back to what the point in which you were trying to convince to me that, hey, look, Ronnie, sure, there are the turnovers there, but they're still moving the football. It's evident in the scoreboard right now, 16-14. And an 88-yard drive, and Jeff Rumlin has an update for us from the sideline. Jeff. Guys, Patel Troutman, knee bruise on the left knee. He will return, says team doctors. All right. Well, he's been a trooper today. He's been in and out of the lineup. He's been in and out of the lineup all year long. He's had uh, problems with that knee. And, of course, uh, sometimes the tender spot uh, just kind of raises his ugly head when you don't want it to. You know, the thing about it, it didn't look like anyone really hit him that bad. Every time he's gone out, it doesn't look like he's taken a serious fall. However, obviously, that knee is tremendously tender. And any time it takes any type of foul action, he responds in a negative way. So the kickoff by Jody Spear is down in the end zone. Blakeney will not run it out. So it's been brought out to the 20-yard line where it will be first down and 10. When you look at the latest 1AA poll, Florida A&M still uh, in the hunt for the Heritage Bowl, but North Carolina A&T not far from being ranked this week. Uh, they were like around 25 or something like that in the, in the rankings of 26. They were just a hair away from going in to the top uh, 25 rankings. They haven't made a lot of believers nationwide. A lot of people are wondering how they've had so much success. One of the reasons they've had it is running the football, and that was, of course, Maurice. Big Maurice didn't get many yards on that carry there. <laughs> Maurice Smith. So the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats show they can get a sustained drive going if they just hold on to the football. That last drive started at their own 12. They go 88 yards, and they put it in the end zone with Jeremy Thomas sneaking it in from one yard out and it is second down and nine now for the Aggies who lead it by a score of 16 to 12. They got to put the ball in the air the Aggies do they've been running the football but right now I'd like to see Chris Caldwell get the football and do some amazing things with Darius Helton their fine wide receiver. And we're going to get a legal procedure or a false start against the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Tempest is starting to flare man. 
People getting a little edgy out there. This game is on the line. We've got a heck of a football game. It's 16 to 12, 817 left in the third quarter. Well, these teams again have been talking a lot of trash over the years. Right to the snap. Ball start on the offense. Replay the down. So false start on the offense. We played it down. And that'll move the ball back to about a second down and 13 situation. Farmer the up back in the eye. Bo Smith is the second back. Play action. Back to pass is battle. Has some running room. Decides he's going to take off and run, but he's not going to get far. He was run down from behind on the near sideline. Yeah, it was Chuck Powell, and Chuck Powell was with the acceleration, and what I liked is that he came from the backfield to do exactly that, number 49. Jimmy Williams, 50, 48. Jimmy Williams was the man who made the, the tackle from New Orleans High in Miami. That was a nice thing coming from behind and from that position on the football field. Anytime you can run the quarterback down like that, you're doing your job. Third down and five. Farmer goes in motion. Nobody behind the quarterback battle. And we got a flag again. Here's Rolando North trying to turn the corner. Romando, a very quick individual out of West Charlotte High in Charlotte, North Carolina. Very close to that first down mark in front of the Aggie bench. But we're going to get a flag against the Aggies. They've been penalized in the first half alone. They were penalized six times. Both teams picked up six penalties in the first half. All right, just got to know Terry Doctor is out with a sprained ankle. And he's been out just about all game. So but you know what? That defense is starting to play extremely well without him. They certainly have. We thought that was going to be a devastating blow, but uh, it hasn't hurt them that much. Illegal shift against the offense. Five yards. Replay the down. There, let's see, I don't know who that is right now. I can't see the face. That may be Relaford. Yes. It's probably Relaford right now. From the Aggies of North Carolina A&T, Lynn Relaford went out in the first half. Terry Docker is out. Trotland's ailing. The referee went down. Battles back to pass. And here's a pass out in the flat. And not much going on after the reception for Darius Helton. He got the ball and will bring up a fourth down punting situation Man, for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Man, it's almost like someone let the air out of the offense of the A&T offense. see, I don't think they really had the offense today. Again, they were fortunate that they had the ball because of six turnovers by uh, Bethune-Cookman. But they still haven't uh, shown a whole lot as far as their offense today. So from their own 23-yard line, they're back to punt it away. Darian Dock, uh, make that uh, Anthony Moore, the punter, gets a high kickoff. Fair catch called for and made right at the 40-yard line. 16 to 12. And we'll be back. 16 to 12 here in the third quarter. Of course, the winner of this contest takes another step toward the Heritage Bowl. Both of them have to go through Florida a m though, before the season ends. And FAMU also unbeaten in conference play so far this season. First down and 10, Bethune. Fatel Trotman with the pitch back. And here's Rodgers trying to make that Porter, rather, trying to turn the corner. Porter picks up a few yards out to about the 43-yard line. A gain of three. It'll be second down and seven for Terran Porter. Wrapped up there by Dwayne Carpenter, number 19. You'll see Porter right here. He gets the football off the pitch out by Patel Troutman. Watch that Carpenter on his back. Dwayne's had a pretty good game today. Out of Troy, North Carolina, West Montgomery High. Second down, seven for Bethune Cookman. Thomas, the lone setback. And Troutman wants to go back to pass, and he throws, and it's going to be intercepted secondary by Tramel Perquette. So the seventh turnover of the day by Bethune. Not a good pass by the quarterback, Patel Troutman, his seventh interception of the year. 
Mel Perquette act as if he was intended to be the receiver instead of the defender. Watch him here. Patel Troutman, everyone has talked about the fact that he's throwing a little bit more. Came into this game 9 of 24, 19 of 24 in the last two games in which he's had a lot of success throwing the football right here. He makes a huge mistake, and Perquette makes him pay. Perquette's first interception of the year. He's a young man who's moved from the running back spot. Six plays, three minutes and 19 seconds is the longest drive that A&T's had today. And they still, they still wind up punting the football away. So, again, that goes back to the fact that they have not been able to sustain any long drives. They got their 16 points because of the mistakes by Bethune-Cookman. One thing, Jason Battle has not been able to get off the way that he wants. And let's face it, here's the kid that he came into this kid, he came into this game doing extremely well. You know what? He's getting a lot of pressure though, and the pressure is coming from all angles. As a matter of fact, every time he turns around, he sees that maroon. He sees those Wildcats coming at him. He thinks about throwing the ball. He says, "No, I better hold on to it." And he runs out of bounds. See, Any damage can be done. A lot of times, you, you you say they're not doing well, but you forget that the other team is out there playing too. And they, they're, they've trained all week in practice to try to stop you. As Mo Smith has rough going downfield. Tell you what, you talked about it earlier in the football game. You're having some problems with the footing out there. And Mo Smith saw an opening. However, he slipped. Late flag. And this will be a dead ball flag. And it's going to be either against uh, one of these two teams here. Let's see somebody got a little rambunctious down there on the tackle. The Bethune-Cookman players seemingly thinking it's against the Aggies of A&T. They're both po pointing to each other. A&T is walking backwards right now, so it may be against them. It's going to be a dead ball personal foul penalty. I can see that. That's a big one. Moses Norman is our referee. Marty Cobb shaking up earlier in the contest. We have a dead ball, personal foul on the offense. They're down, they're down. One score we have in, Howard University down at Norfolk State leading 3-0. Well, at least they got that shutout off their back from a week ago, 51-0. Uh, with a minute 45 left in the first quarter. Six minutes to go here in the third here. A four-point ball game between Bethune and North Carolina A&T. Now we may have offsides against Bethune. The play is getting very sloppy for as well-tuned as these two teams are. These are the types of mistakes you shouldn't be making. The false starts, the illegal shifts, the offsides. Offside on the defense. Five yards. He played it down. Yeah, the nose guard, Rod Smith, jumped off sides. As a matter of fact, Big Rod was trying to get over that center to get into that backfield. Third and 20 right now for the Aggies. And they give off to Farmer. And Farmer has nowhere to go as Jimmy Williams got the linebacker, uh, got his uh, arm around the ankle of uh, Eric Farmer, wouldn't let him go anywhere. The linebacker out of Norland High down in Miami. Did a nice Bill job. Hayes. Did a nice job of getting into the backfield because what was about to happen, he was about to turn up field. He was about to turn up field off the right tackle. Bill Hayes, you see him there, 13th coach at the school, only two losing seasons. His first two years, that was 88 and 89. In fact, he spent 12 years at Winston-Salem, had a record of 89, 40, and 2. And it's a career 170 win record. Not a good punt this time. Again, and it hit one of the Aggies in the back and dies right at about the 44-yard line. We'll be back. 16 to 12 is our score. The Aggies holding on by four. And Patel and White just finished talking. Patel is over. Center, hands off. And not much running room that time for Rodgers. Jay Rodgers. Uh, when you talk about the rest of the season, you look at Bethune-Cookman's schedule. Next week, they're at home against Hampton University. They travel up to Norfolk uh, to play Norfolk State the week after. Then they close out the season 
November 20th in Orlando in the Florida Classic. That's a game that traditionally brings over 60 some thousand people to the Florida Citrus Bowl there in Orlando. They play Florida A&M in that game November 20th. Second down and nine now for Bethune Cookman and the Wildcats. Trotman working from the gun this time. One step drop throws has a complete Antonio Stanley who retreated and actually lost some of his forward momentum maybe gain about a, a yard on the play and that's it it'll be third down and eight let's check out some other games in the MEAC some very big games happening as far as Delaware State and Florida a and they're playing down in Tallahassee no score between South Carolina State and Hampton and of course Howard we mentioned earlier leading Norfolk State in the first quarter three to nothing all big games as we go down the stretch and everybody's jockeying for positions they want some postseason honors third down and eight for Bethune right now Lash comes in a slot goes in motion now Stanley's on a wing to the left two people moving at the same time so that's a flag against the offense Trotman just throws it and he throws it out of bounds and it may be declined the penalty yeah, it looked like there was some holding there well, uh, beside Jim the Rogers. beside the holding, there was there was on the offensive side two people moving at the same time. You had a man in motion. That illegal shift on the offense declined. Fourth down. Got to bring up a fourth and eight situation. Got to bring on the punting unit for Bethune Cookman College. Jody Spear will come on the punt of the way, averaging 39 yards per punt. But he has had one block so far this year. And Chris Caldwell is the deep man to return for the Aggies. So this drive started at their own 44. They are punting it from their own 46. Chris Caldwell, second in the conference in punt returns, averaging 14.8 yards per return. Spear gets off a good one. Caldwell retreats, picks it up, and falls down at about the eight-yard line. So that's where they will go to work, the Aggies, the third possession of the second half. And, of course, Fallstone Productions stay at the Adams Mark in Daytona Beach, the Daytona Beach Resort. The Adams Mark is Daytona's premier resort with all amenities and the best variety of dining and entertainment. All rooms are oceanfront, located at 100 North Atlantic Avenue. The Adams Mark is the premier resort in Daytona Beach. For reservations, all you have to do is call them at 1-800-TOLL-FREE-444-ADAM. 317, the time remaining here. Charlie Neal, Ronnie Duncan, Jeff Rump, Rumlin, and the Aggies leading it by four, but they fumble the football, and let's see. The Aggies have lost it. Their third turnover today, and a and has lost the football. Bethune comes up with it. You know, sooner or later, good things are going to start happening for the Wildcats, and it's happening right now. They're capitalizing on the mistakes of North Carolina A&T. Maybe the true colors are coming out. You can see right here that Jason Battle never got a grip on that ball. Bad snap, either from the center or either from him trying to handle it. Take a look at it right here. You'll see the center right under the ball. But you know what? It hit the foot instead of even hitting the hands. And that's bad. That's a bad move to make at a time like this. And look what the ball is inside the 10. And this is Troutman's territory. And when they get into that red zone, they normally score. Jay Rogers, the lone setback. And Rogers has the football, but he's not going to go anywhere as he's met in the hole by Robert Williams. Robert Williams taking him down for a loss. The defense has to answer the call. They've got all the numbers. They're the top defense in the MEAC. Now they've got to step up and do the job. And right now, 16 to 12 is not a very huge lead. That's only four points. And one guy who wants this victory, that man right there. You talk about a guy who can't re can't forget. You know, my, my grandmother used to always say this thing. She's Mary Jane McQuaid. Uh, I can forgive, and I can't forget. I believe that uh, Coach Wyatt thinks the same way. He thinks back every time he takes on A&T to that 73 the seven trashing and he says hey Billy was running up the score Chris Brown is the man hobbling off out of Sarasota Riverview soul of the offensive line started every game a couple of years ago red shirted in 96 and 98 honorable mention last year all the MEAC as you look at Bill Hayes on the other side of the field his defense backs against the wall with all the opportunities they've had they have not played that well offensively that is the Aggies oh and, that, today. and that's hurt them because of the simple fact that they've had the momentum they've had the huge lead and they have let 
Bethune Cookman come right back and perhaps take this game and take the lead. We'll see what happens on this series. Second and goal from the 11 yard line. Again, Rodgers skipping through there. Really not uh, handling good opening and not a good hole. Uh, they needed to do a little bit more to spread that oh, out. Definitely. They got to spread out this ball. They've got to open it up. And you know what? He's probably going to go to the lucky job. There are two things that can happen right now. You're talking about Antonio Stanley. He's back into the game. You're talking about going with maybe four to five wide receivers. They did that the last time they scored. And obviously with Patel Troutman, you know that he is a dangerous man anytime he has the football. Now again, they're down by four. There's still a lot of time left. We're in the third quarter. They could still kick a field goal, come to within one, but you got to remember Danny Mathis, who is their kicker, has missed his last two PATs in this contest. It should be only a two-point ball game. Trotman is brought down right away by, guess who, number 97, Robert Williams, who's been playing a whale of ball game along, along that defensive line, and Trotman never got on track. He gets off the ball extremely well, number 97. I'm talking about Robert Williams. Watch him here. Once the snap is made, look who's in the backfield. And Patel Trotman says, how did he get to me that quickly? How did he get in the backfield that fast? You see, man, he's like light. He didn't even see him. So this will be a 29-yard field goal attempt by Danny Mathis. He is 7 of 11 in field goals this year. He was 20 of 20 in PATs before today's game. We get a procedure penalty even though the kick is good, and it's going to be against number 71, Jesus Sardé. He raised up a little bit too soon before the ball was snapped, and that left uh, tackle spot. But the kick was good. But it won't count. Right to the snap. Ball start on the offense. Replay to down. If we saw, see it, you'll watch 71. He moves a little prematurely before the ball was snapped. And that is what precipitated the penalty flag. So rather than a 29-yard field goal attempt, it's going to be... 34-yard field goal attempt. He's kicked the 47-yard of this year. This one is up, but it is good. <laughs> I wasn't sure the way the official was looking at it. It is good. So they pulled it within one. Mathis with the 34-yard field goal attempt. Pulls his team to within one, 16-15 here in the third quarter with 54 seconds left. We've got a close one. Just one point. You know, this could be a game that Bethune-Cookman could easily be on top of. Some point after this had been made. And uh, it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens as we work the clock. Billy Hayes has to tell his troops, we must move the football. But in order to do that, Billy Hayes has to start getting his quarterback, Jason Battle, to find his receivers. Anytime you got a Darius Helton, number 13, on the field, Romando North, number one. Anytime you've got a Chris Carwell or Desmond Adams, you've got to use these people, and you've got to use them to the best of their ability. Now, as far as the tight end is concerned, that is number 88, Marcus Bryson. We have got to see that happen, but you know what? The reason it hasn't happened, the defense has been there all day long consistently without Terry Doctor, the leading tackler for Bethune-Cookman. He's out right now, but still, Bethune-Cookman is finding ways to do it, and they're finding ways to do it with Lydell Jackson, Willie Doby, Abdul Yates, Rod Smith, Damian Cook, all those guys playing well. And let's check out that ground scoring drive. Four plays, six yards, 34-yard field goal by Mathis. And the time used off the clock. Aggies, an up man, picks it up. And not much running room for him as he is dropped back at about the 21, 22 yard line. That was Asa Evans, the strong safety out of Fayetteville, North Carolina, who came up with it. You know what? You got a Bethune Cookman player on the field right now that's pretty shaken up in that whole series off the special teams. So I think it's a lot. Kenneth. Who's that, Kenneth Finley? You know, we look all year long, the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats in coming into today's game in seven games had only had turned the ball over 13 times. Well, actually, a total of uh, 22 times. 13 fumbles, nine interceptions, but today 
They've turned the ball over seven times. The Aggies three. That's ten turnovers between the two teams in uh, in a game that was supposed to be, you know, one of the your, your showcase games. And the teams, neither one, have did a good job of protecting the football. First down and ten at the 21-yard line for the Aggies, leading by one. Here's a pass to Darius Hope. Now let's go down to Jeff Rumlin for an injury report. Jeff. Guys, offensive lineman Chris Brown, his foot was stepped on. He should be able to go back in the game. Charlie, you have to wonder, with all of these injuries, how BCC will continue in this game and further down the road, because they're getting knocked down real hard. They certainly are, and uh, a lot of people have gone to the sideline and have not come back today. And some people who we didn't expect to see have come on and played because they were a little banged up. But you have to sometimes button that chin strap and give that extra effort, especially when the chips are down. One second down. Battle wants to put it in the air, reverses his field, and gets a little running room, but he runs right into the heart of the defense of Bethune-Cookman. And that's the end of the third quarter here in Daytona Beach. One-point ball game, the Aggies. By one. Need a new look for your living here in Daytona Beach, 16-15. Aggies by one over the Wildcats of Bethune Cookman. Let's check out our third quarter. Bank of America stats for the game. Bethune Cookman doing a good job on the ground after still struggling early in this contest. In fact, lead in overall yards and first downs. But they have actually seven turnovers now as opposed to six. Tell you what, mounting turnovers, mounting points, the change in the flow of this game. Third down and uh, bobbled by battle, but he manages to pick it up. Darius Helton has the reception, but he's still way short of, short of a first down at about the 28-29 yard line. So to bring up a fourth down situation, fourth and about three. They took my suggestion and went to, of course, their wide receiver, Darius Helton, on two of the series. But once again, just bad snaps and bad pursuit with that football. I'm talking about the Aggies of North Carolina and T. Charlie, their offense out of sync. They just can't seem to generate any positive yardage. Rashawn Mathis is deep to receive the punt of Anthony Moore, who's been a busy man this afternoon. Mathis at about the 34-yard line retreats. He never go backward, you go forward. And he was at the 34, he takes him back to the 29. So he lost five yards on the punt return. And but it'll be Bethune's ball, first down and 10 from their own 29-yard line. They trail it by one, 16-15. We talked about all the points that North Carolina a t had scored this year against MEAC opponents. They've been held pretty much in check today. 28 was the lowest, and that was against Norfolk State. You can have all the numbers in the world, but when you're talking about an intense rivalry such as the one we are witnessing here today, strange things can happen. And we get uh, Josh Rogers, or Jay Rogers, trying to get it going. Jay picks up, who actually, actually lost about a yard on the play, second down and 11. 28 points was the lowest output against uh, MEAC opponent for the Aggies this year, and that occurred against Norfolk State. They scored three times in the fourth quarter in that game that was tied 7-7 at the half. They had 41 points against Hampton, most of 141 yards rushing. 30 points against Morgan, 411 offensive yards. Here's Troutman on the reverse. But there's a man right there in his face. Good defense for Eric Lash, who was trying to reverse. And the Aggies stayed home. They were not full defensively. Once again, you look around and you always see the Aggies on defense. The reason they play that defense so well is that they make the adjustments. Anytime you can do that when there is the end in the round, when you have the options, when there are definitely pitches on the opposite side of the field, when you can get more than three people on the tackle, you're doing good pursuit of the football. Sean Taylor was the man who caused Eric Lash to slow it down. And then... Sean had help from his friends. A whole bunch of gold jerseys came to the rescue. Now, Alvin Wyatt, he's beside himself because some of the players, he had too many people on the field or not enough. Anyway, he calls a timeout, and he's in Patel's face. We'll be back. A&T by one was talking about Alvin Wyatt. He had 34 interceptions as a 
collegian who played here at Bethune-Cookman College, and it still stands as an all-time career performance over his career. And there's a the symbol of the injuries, our referee, Marty Cobb, who went out with a bruised shoulder. But you know what? Doesn't want to leave the game. He's he wants to see the very ending. There's no question about it. On third down and long, Patel Troutman throws as a complete. And it should be enough for a first down in front of the Aggie bench at about the 41-yard line. Eric Lash was, Lash the was the man who came up with the reception. High snap or high pass, but Lash went up and got it. You know, they say this young man can throw the football when he finds the time. And look at him rolling out, and he finds Eric Lash. Lash with a nice reception. Came back to the ball, gave uh, a little cushion between him and the defender. Out of the 40-yard line is where the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats have the ball. First down and 10. We're in the fourth quarter from the shotgun. Troutman throws again, and it's last again on the reception at midfield. And he's about a yard shy of a first down. It'll be second down and one as Sammy Rogers was defending for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Comes back again for the ball, and what I like about it, he does it from the other side. But you know why he's able to get open? You know why he's able to come back? Tremendous speed, and that's what you get in a great wide receiver, and he's growing in confidence every time that Patel throws the ball his way. Second down and one. Jeremy Thomas is back there with Patel, who is again working from the shotgun. And Patel, he's going to run it for the first down this time. Has the first down with plenty to spare and has run out of bounds at about the 48-yard line. Wisely runs out of bounds before Dwayne Carpenter can lower the boom. You know, that's discipline. You know, before, you probably would have seen him try to go ahead for even more yards, but he recognizes, you know what? I've been very fortunate. I haven't had a serious injury. They've had to take me out for a blow here and there. 16 carries, 72 yards, and he's close to his average, average of 85 yards per game, and that's what's important. But the other thing is how North Carolina a t right now, they, they're confused. They don't know if they should uh, do their lane assignments uh, or whether they should go for the quarterback. They're just all confused right now. Option again, and the pitch back. Jeremy Thomas, and he's run out of bounds in front of the Bethune bench. Jeremy Thomas run out at about the 39-yard line. Darrell Clue was there defending. Let's watch it. Trotman did a good job of selling it. And then, of course, Thomas was able to pick up some yards. He didn't think he was going to pick up. That's and they run the short side of the field. Yeah, but you're running the option extremely well right now, and especially that's what you're supposed to do. You sell it to the defense, and then, of course, you give off the little dump. You give off the little hitch, and that's exactly what's happened so far. The lane assignments have not been read perfectly by the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Troutman hurdles somebody, gets it off, and Jeremy Thomas gets the first down on what looked like a helter-skelter type of a play that wasn't supposed to go anywhere. I tell you what, he's a bad man. He can make things happen. He can ad-lib on the football field. You talk about creativity. He's Picasso out there. Watch him here. He doesn't have anything going on, but it's his athleticism. Jumps right over the player and finds his man. There's Mr. Thomas. And it's first down for Bethune-Cookman. 11.05 to go. 31-yard line of the Aggies. Look at that turf, all loose up and down. The turf is hurting both teams, but you know what? Seems like it's not hurting the Wildcats as much. Troutman pitches to Jeremy Thomas again, who turns the corner for a yard. Gaining in confidence, that's what's happening right now with the Wildcats. This is their stadium. We're here at Daytona Beach Municipal Stadium. As a matter of fact, you could hear some of the students say, why aren't we winning this game? We should be further ahead in this game. Well, I tell you what, if you win, you win. If you come back and win, it's even a better thing. And right now, they're only down by one point. I'm talking to Wildcats of Bethune-Cookman. Shifting ties, the ebb and flow. Charlie, you said it right. Even though North Carolina a and took the early lead, what did they do to get it? Well, they capitalized on the other team's mistakes. Good field position. However, when it came to generating offense, they were stymied so far today. Larry Jones is in at a wide receiver spot, wearing number 14 at the top of the screen. And here's Jeremy Thomas, or make that Patel Trotman on the option, keeps it, takes it all the way down to the 15-yard line. And he took a pretty good hit on that knee, but he jumps right back up. I tell you what, he took a pretty good hit. Maybe not necessarily on that knee, but he had me fooled. As a matter of fact, I thought he still had, didn't have the ball. Watch him here. He's like Houdini with the football. Yeah, he gets the defense. The defense thinks they've got the man wrapped up, but you know what? Keep your eye on number nine, Patel Trotman. He is the leader of the charge for the Wildcats of Bethune. Cookman and right now with this ball getting closer and closer to that end zone 
you know he is the go-to guy. First down and 10 at the 15 of A&T, trailing by one point. Rodgers, Rodgers inside the 10, Rodgers at the 5, Rodgers at the 4. Jay Rodgers, first and goal for the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats. The Jay, surge, they move the pile forward. I tell you what, they're moving it forward, they're moving it forward with that fine offensive line. You got guys like Chris Brown, you get Mr. Porter, you get Hubbard, all those guys are moving the football. And anytime you got that type, look at that, number 72, just all over the Gabriel football. Gabriel Just moving people out of the way. That's what it's all about. He was a first-team all-conference player in high school at Tampa's Jefferson High. He's blocking people today. First and goal for Bethune-Cookman. Porter is the man on the wing to the left side. Troutman calling the signals. The North Carolina A&T showing blitz, and they do a good job with Brad Holmes coming in and reading the play and Jay Rogers getting nothing. In fact, losing a couple of yards. He may have lost a couple of yards there, but once again, it's the inconsistency of the defense. You're talking about North Carolina A&T, one of the best defensive teams in the country in Division I AA. I mean, the Aggies were third in total defense, fifth in scoring defense, and pass defense in the nation. Not just the NEAC, but the entire nation of Division I AA schools. And right now, they are getting schooled by the offense led by Patel Troutman and the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats. Second and goal from the eight-yard line. From the shotgun, Troutman stands out close. Jay Rogers cannot hold on to the football. Heard those footsteps. And he was trying to run before he catches. It's one of the, what they call WBIH. Did not watch ball in hands. And he tried <laughs> to get upfield before he got the football. So it'll bring up a third down and goal. Even a field goal here would put them in the lead, but I know Alvin Wyatt would like a little more breathing room. With 8.24 to go, he'd like to put six on the board. What and they've done so well seven. in the fourth quarter is that they've taken time off the clock. They have moved this football down. There he is. Johnny Mathis. He missed Jesus. a couple of extra points today. Yes, he did. And here again from the shotgun. Troutman throws, has it complete. Not enough for a first down, though, or touchdown, actually. He has it complete on the near sideline, and that's Hubbard on the reception. And it's fourth down. Now, do we go for it, or do you kick the field goal to get the lead? I think you have to go for the field goal. This is one of those situations where it's not, you know, I don't think there's much of a brainer here. <laughs> I tell you what, you've got to play it safe, and obviously it's not much of a brainer, but it gives Bethune-Cookman the lead for the first time in this game. You're talking about an opportunity to put 18 unanswered points on the foot. Look at that. The goal post is not straight. The goal post is leaning off to the side. That's okay. The goal post is doing a lean right now. I think the officials see it leaning, too. <laughs> So the officials are uh, looking at the goal post lane. Let's hear the explanation. He's got a gangster lane going on. He was talking. Uh, I couldn't hear what Moses Norman was saying. We missed it. But uh, he did uh, try to explain something about what was happening. But uh, either way, we're going to have about a 20-yard, 20 21-yard field goal by Danny Mathis. They added some time on the clock. Danny Mathis from the left hash mark. The ball is up. It is good. So Bethune Cookman with Danny Mathis, 21-yard field goal. He's hit the last two. Remember, he won the game against South Carolina State a couple of weeks ago, and they lead it by two right now. 16 Bethune who trailed early in this ball game, 16 to nothing, has turned the ball over seven times. It resulted in 16 points for A&T uh, in the lead for the first time this afternoon. And they are still playing very tough on special teams, not allowing the special teams people to get good field position as Taz Redden was downfield quickly to make the stop defensively for the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats who lead it by two. Let's check out the Greyhound scoring drive and that was a long drive. Remember that was a drive for Bethune that started at their own 29 yard line. They used up 556 off the clock. They went 60 yards and a 15 play drive before Danny Mathis kicked his second consecutive field goal of the ball game.
Now the Aggies have the ball first down and 10 at their own 19 yard line. And here's a new quarterback in the lineup and it's intercepted. But Phil Cookman has the football intercepted. I think it's Nick Rawls who has come up with the interception. It is Nick Rawls his first interception of the year. Not a good pass and a new quarterback in the lineup for the for North Carolina A&T. Tim Funderburk is the man who threw the pass. So he's probably got the strongest arm, but it was too strong that time. Obviously, and it was a huge mistake. North Carolina a and trying to find some answers. Couldn't get anything generated with Jason Battle. Now they're going with Funderburg, and Funderburg made a big mistake. First time up. So the fourth turnover by the Aggies today, and now Bethune with a two-point lead and the ball at the Aggie 41-yard line. First down and 10 after the interception by Nick Rawls. The option to keep the ball on the ground, gain about five yards, going straight ahead. And the man who got the carry was Jeremy Thomas, who's been the workhorse today. 34-27 was the score a year ago up in Greensboro, North Carolina with the Aggies losing in overtime to Bethune-Cookman, spoiling their homecoming. It's right now 18-16. Bill Hayes has never beaten Alvin Wyatt since Alvin Wyatt has become, become the head coach of Bethune-Cookman. Jeremy Thomas again trying to get some breathing room. And let's talk about the significance of this game when you look at the standings. Florida A&M and North Carolina A&T come in both uh, today unbeaten in conference play but Thune has two conference losses if a t loses that would be their first conference loss Delaware State's playing Florida A&M later on we don't have a score in that game yet but let's say uh, that holds up as as such and Florida A&M continues to win again but Thune is sitting in the driver's seat right now now both of them have Florida A&M to play both of them have to play Florida A&M before the end of the season. Troutman throws incomplete, last had it, let it go, would have been a first down. It'll bring up a fourth down. Now that would bring on Danny Mathis, possibly. Let's see how long this field goal would be should he come in the ball game. Let's see how, what kind of confidence Coach Wyatt has in him. It would probably be about a 51-yard field goal. I think they want to go for it. Coach Wyatt's over talking things over with his assistant coaches on the sideline. He's going to get a delay of game penalty if he doesn't hurry up. The game clock or play clock is down to 10 seconds. He's going to have to call a timeout and talk things over. Because it would be about a 51-yard field goal. So we'll take one. Two-point lead. And Patel Troutman talking things over with Wyatt. Situation facing... The Wildcats of Bethune-Cookman actually is fourth and about three. They're going to go for it from the shotgun. Trockman. Reversing his field. He's in trouble. Gets away from one of the Aggies. Still has some running room down the sideline. Throws back in the middle of the field. Lash has it. First down inside the 20 to the 19 to Eric Lash. You're talking about Houdini escapability. You can't get any better than that. You know what? They called the other guy, Antonio Stanley, Mr. Excitement. I think this is a Mr. Excitement part one, two, three, and four. This kid is simply awesome. You I talk mean, about he, Houdini. He must have retreated this. about 40 I mean, yards. You, you think he's going to be caught, and then all of a sudden, they can't hold on. V.J. Little almost has him. Paylor almost has him. There's Little again with him. And this guy finds the open man, and there he is, Eric Lash, sitting in the middle of the field, soft spot in his own. He gets there, and it's a first down. He separated himself from the defenders. That is, Lash did a good job. And here's... Jay Rogers with nowhere to go because Sammy Rogers slams into the turf. But a pickup of one, it'll be second down and nine. Now that timeout that Bethune used was their last timeout. a t has all three timeouts remaining. Now look at the clock. This is good, have to be good clock management on the part of 
Bethune Cookman right now. They have the ball. It is a second down. You want to keep possession of the ball, run as much time off the clock, put some points on the board, and go away with a victory. That's the game plan. That's what very easily has said. To say is, look, especially for us sitting get, up here. <laughs> most definitely. But AT is saying, can we stop them from getting to the end zone? The other aspect. Oh, oh. there's bad, bad toss by okay. Trotman. That spelled doom to them earlier as they tried to get that ball this time to Traron Porter. And Porter was wise enough and astute enough to jump on it and not try to pick it up. That could have been a big break for the Aggies. Could have been a big break for the Aggies. That's something they were able to capitalize in in the first quarter of this football game. We're no longer in the first quarter. We're in the fourth quarter. So far, ever since that point, all the breaks have been going for the Wildcats. And they have the lead now, 18-16. But what I was about to say is simply this. They could should hope for a field goal. North Carolina a are just simply shutting them down because they still have a shot to win this football game with that much time left on the clock. Third and 17, big third down play for Bethune today. And this will not be complete. And Eric Lash again was the intended receiver on the near side out of Rutherford High in Springfield, Florida. Came into today's game averaging 16 and a half yards per reception on 10 catches. So they're going to try maybe a field goal this time. As I see Danny Mathis coming on the football field, this will be about a 42 yard field goal attempt. You know, Eric. Lash has beaten Josh Rogers all second half of this football game. You know what? He almost turned another reception coming back. It's his speed. His speed is able to break himself away from the goal. I mean, from the defender. All right, let's go to that crooked goal post that can help you out this time. Blocked! And the Aggies have it! And it's, and it's a forward pitch. It's a touchdown that's going to be called back. It was a forward lateral. It was a good block. It will not be a touchdown, but it will be the Aggies ball. You know, they did it twice last week against Howard, and I'm talking about blunts, uh, blocking punts and kickoffs. Let's watch it again and see exactly who gets it. One thing we do know, Mr. Parker was going all the way down for a touchdown. However, they had to call it back because, of course, you can't do that. It's illegal. Well, you can't forward lateral the ball. That's what happened. That's why it was brought back because it was a forward lateral. Now watch the block here. Who lays out? 25 or was it 54? 54 laid out for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Arthur Wilson. And now there's the lateral. It's a forward lateral from Sammy Rogers to Von Keith Spencer. And so that's why it's going to be brought back and not be a touchdown, but it still should be the Aggies ball. It's not a penalty. Well, it is a penalty because it's an illegal forward pass. You cannot have a forward lateral. And the official who threw the flag, Ted Todd Reese, he was right there to see. And it's the same thing I saw from up here. On the block punt and on the run back. That was an illegal forward pass against Gold. Got to be a five-yard penalty from the spot, and now ball. That's the way it is. A five-yard penalty from the spot of the forward lateral, and the Aggies still retain possession of the football. All right, they win games on defense right now, and now the Aggies have to call on their offense to pull them out. If Funderburk is going to come back into this football game, he's going to have to look at the last series and recognize that he threw the big interception that almost led to another touchdown by Bethune-Cookman. Let's see if we can see this from a distance, because, you know, Daryl Clue got in there as well. And there's the block. Now watch Sammy Rogers. He's got the ball. Now he push, shifts it forward to Von Keith Spencer. And that's why it is brought back. Well, I don't know why he's not comfortable with the call. That is Coach Hayes. Of course, we want every edge. And you want a full explanation of why it's not a touchdown, especially in a close ball game like that. Especially Both coaches are out on the field working the officials. Bill Hayes has gone back to the sideline. Alvin White still doesn't look very yeah. happy about it either. Look at that face on Coach Hayes, man. Well, this is, you know, we're in crunch time. 421. Hey, that's how they make that living. This is a big rivalry. That's right. This just isn't any game. That's Alvin White on the other sideline and Bethune Cookman. Here's the five yard penalty. So the drive will start now at their own 30. 
seven yard line. This is a and T leading it by uh, trailing by two points. 18 16. So you make uh, your own opportunities and that was a big opportunity. A big break for Jason battles back in the game for the Aggies of North Carolina and T as you said battles back at quarterback almost chip handing the ball off and not much doing as they try to keep the ball on the ground and hand it off to Maurice Smith Maurice Smith didn't get anything going as Taz Red made sure hey a and T still has all three timeouts remaining Taz Red look at him if you're looking at this game, you're probably surprised that North Carolina A&T is undefeated in conference play the way they've demonstrated and orchestrated their offense today. They just don't have it. But you see, you can't take anything away from Bethune Cookman. They came to play also. Here we go. Mo Smith trying to turn the corner the other way. And nothing happening as Abdul Yates was there to bring him down. Most definitely, Charlie, and it's true. I mean, they have brung it to him all day long. You talk about bringing the football. You talk about the defense clamming down. You're making sure that you're cutting people short. I mean, let's face it. We've seen Mo Smith just terrorize teams the way he did Norfolk about three weeks ago. But Abu Yates does not give up. Relentless in his pursuit to make sure he brings down Mo Smith. Third down and 10. 3.42 to time. Still clock uh, still running. Time remaining. And I think maybe we're going to see the Aggies. Now I thought we were going to see a timeout, but there's a little confusion on who was in the lineup at that particular time. And now we are going to see a timeout by the Aggies. So they use their first. They have two remaining. Bethune has used all three of theirs in the second half, but they lead it by two. We'll be back. Down play of the game as you look at Patel Trotman on the right hand side who has engineered a great comeback for his Bethune Cookman Wildcats. Bethune Cookman number one in the conference in third down conversions with their opponents. That is defending the third down conversion. Let's see what happens here. And it is a lateral point and out of bounds, but short of a first down for the Aggies. They only get up to about the 44 yard line. Adrian Parks tried to make it happen. It's called a hook and ladder. Well, hook and lateral. <laughs> That's how you want to look at it. Your yeah, they thought they had it, as a matter of fact. And you know what? For a second, I thought they were going to get the first down, but not enough. And obviously, there's no turning back. There's no more tomorrow. You go for it on fourth down. Fourth down at about three. The ball at the 44-yard line. This year, the Aggies in fourth down situations. Only one of 15. And they use their second timeout as battle goes over to the sideline. So you've got to be ready for everything. The defensive coordinator, Pete Adrian, for the uh, Bethune Cookman Wildcats put together a pretty good game plan today. I'm sure he watched the Elon film, saw what Elon was able to do to the Aggies uh, of North Carolina ANT. Plus, uh, offensively, you know, they know what they can do against them on the offensive side of the ball. So all of those things, very, very important. Most definitely. You know, Elon beat up on North Carolina a t the one blemish they have on their record. If there's any similarity, both teams run the option. You know, the thing about it is that when you got a kid like Patel Troutman, on the football field. And I don't know how many times I think he went out of this game, but two or three times, and there he is. Obviously, he will be out player of the game. Should they hold win on to win this one? Yeah, but win or lose, he's yeah. definitely out player of the game for uh, Bethune Cookman. This young man is just simply talented. The first time I ever got a chance to see him, I saw what he looked like. I said, you know what? This kid simply can play. Not only can he play, he generates excitement. He is the reason why Alvin Wyatt. Should, you know what? As a matter of fact, Coach Wyatt should have given half of that trophy a coach of the year to him last year because this kid is one of the reasons why his team is so good. So a fourth down play. We said that third down play was the biggest of the game. This fourth down play is the biggest for both squads. It's going to be a big play. Let's and see what Bethune. happens with Maurice Smith. you got Eric Farmer there in the I formation. you got their two wide receivers. they got to make something happen. Ken Bethune hold on. And here's a play action. Battle with some time. Throws incomplete. Incomplete. And a flag goes down. We may have interference against Bethune Cookman. Let's see. A late flag comes in. A late flag comes Rodney in. Rodney Bush, the tight end, was being held. I wonder if the official caught that. Interference against Bethune is the call. 
And a first down is going to be granted to the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Against the defense. The spot foul. First down. Let me take that back. That was actually Darius Helton who was held number 13, one of the leading receivers on this team. He was wide open, Charlie. And if you can see it, let's see if you can see exactly what happens. Because, see, he's being held. Can we see it? There's, there's a hole there by number 96, but this Darius Helton. And there's all of a sudden, Darius right Helton there. goes down. Here's Bo Smith into the secondary. And he has another first down inside the 40 to about the 39. Now keep in mind, a field goal can win this game. A field goal wins it for the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Darren Dawkins, 6 of 9. He's hit a 42-yarder this year. Has not had any block. Danny Mathis had his first one blocked moments ago. Now on a 42-yard field goal attempt. And uh, again, the tide has turned in favor of the Aggies. Trying to keep this drive alive. Bo Smith again gets outside. He has some running room. Daylight. And he's finally not. Oh, he did. He was run out of bounds at about the 12 or 11-yard line. Make it the 11-yard line for Maurice Smith. Rasim Mitchell, left tackle, number 78, one of the reasons it happened in number 63. Watch this, Kinlock, watch what happens right here. See, right off number 78, off the left tackle, you see exactly what happens, and he makes the extra yardage for himself. This kid is so explosive. I've enjoyed watching him play, and I'm talking about Maurice Smith. But you know what happens a lot of times when you're playing up tight, and it really crowds the line of scrimmage. If you can get past that first wave of defenders, you've got some daylight out there, and now you rely on the secondary to bring your man down. All right, you play a conservative now, you're going for the touchdown, or you just play it to get to the field goal. That's what happens right now, and the time is moving. Moving on the clock, you've got one timeout left. Alvin Wyatt, you know what? He played his cards very early. He has no timeouts left. He can't control well, the clock. A couple, a couple of those timeouts were not necessarily because he wanted to call a timeout. Yeah. There was some confusion out there. In order to be uh, not to, to not to be penalized, they decided that uh, Almost in a couple of situations they had to call a timeout to save the, the five-yard or ten-yard penalty here and there. Put it this way, they're time I'll see what she had back. I'm sure he does. Second down. And here, Maurice Smith this time has stood up. Hubbard, the first man to meet him. Remember, Terry Doctor, who was one of the top leaders, uh, number two in the conference in tackles, went out of this game early with a sprained ankle and has not returned. We've seen a number of players go out. Also, uh, on the defensive side for the Aggies, Lynn Relliford went out. He's out of uniform in the second half in civilian clothes. So we've had uh, our share of injuries. We've seen Patel Trotman in and out of the lineup. We've seen the Aggies use three different quarterbacks today. Uh, we've seen uh, actually two different quarterbacks battle. And Funderburg, we've seen Bethune Cookman use three quarterbacks today. We've seen him use Troutman, Foster, and Taji. Parrish. She looked at uh, Dawkins over on the sideline. Third down. And again, Giddens stands up. The running back, Maurice Smith. And that'll bring up a fourth down situation with one minute, under a minute to go. And here comes Darren Dawkins. So this may be the biggest kick for him this season. Darren Dawkins, six of nine on field goals. Fifth in the conference and field goal percentage at 66 percent they're letting the clock run down it's all the way down to 43 seconds this will be a 25 yard field goal attempt for darren dawkins you can believe every member of that wildcat team is going in for the block the punter antonio moore is the holder it's a high snap it's up and it's long enough and it is good it splits the uprights with 26 seconds to go. Darren Dawkins hits a 25-yard field goal, and it's a one-point ball game once again, 19-18 in favor of the Aggies. It may come right back down to time management. You can talk about the circumstances that led to the fact that Bethune Cookman had no timeouts left in the game, but you know what? Billy Hayes used his timeouts effectively. It all worked out. And once again, they went back to their money guy. I'm talking Maurice Smith, number 43, the big time major league prime time player running back who will burrow you over. And obviously, they went to the greatest side of the football and on that offensive line, the left side, and they were able to open up the holes. That's one of the reasons why. As far as passing the football is concerned, North Carolina couldn't generate that offense today. One 
of the reasons why, obviously, the great defense of Bethune-Cookman. I mean, you've got to be surprised and amazed by what Bethune-Cookman did today without Terry Doctor, one of the leading defensive players in the MEAC, the preseason MEAC Defensive Player of the Year, and he goes out and you're still able to stop them, stymie them, not let them do what they want to do? I tell you what, this is pretty impressive. It's been a heck of a game, 18, 19, 18 right now, and uh, with uh, 26 seconds left to go on the clock, and Troutman with the ball, anything can happen. Well, one of the things they have done is put Antonio Stanley back there, one of the most dangerous return men in the conference uh, to return this uh, kickoff. He's averaging 31 yards per kickoff return, and if he can just get him close, Maybe Danny Mathis will have another opportunity. Remember, that last field goal block is what helped the Aggies go down the field, drive all the way down, and kick a field goal. But regardless of the outcome, Bethune-Cookman will go back to two point afters that were missed. That's true. They missed two point after touchdowns, and they need to pick it up. They remember now the Bethune-Cookman team has no timeouts left. A&T has one remaining. So the ball will be spotted at the 30-yard line, their own 30, but no timeouts left for the Wildcats. Trailing by one, 19-18. Bill Hayes looking to go out of here with a perfect record. He know he's been in a, in a real fight here. He will go 5-0 in the conference, 7-1 overall and remain unbeaten in MEAC play while handing Bethune their third conference loss of the year and dropping them to five and three overall. You know, we talked about Patel being Houdini. He's going to have to perform a heck of a magic act to get to the end zone today. Well, he needs to get some passes near the sidelines. That's the big thing. Or get something completed. Hands up, throws, but this one is still in the field of play. Receiver couldn't get out of bounds. The receiver fell down in the field of play, so the clock continues to run. It's down to 14 seconds. That was Curtis Williams on the reception. Eight seconds, and he spikes the ball with four seconds to go. He's got one shot at the end zone. All right, remember the game can't five, end on a defensive maybe six penalty. Maybe receivers. You remember the, the game cannot end on a defensive penalty. There's a U.S. Marine Corps players of the game. The stats on Mo Smith, he had 104 yards at halftime. 148 to end the game, one touchdown. And Patel Troutman, 96 rushing yards. Four, five and nine passing for 42 yards and one touchdown. And again, he was in and out of the lineup. Troutman had uh, 66 yards on first down. There. They got five receivers in the game right now, Charlie. And, of course, you've got to let it go just like they did just before halftime. Hopefully, maybe your man can come up with it. There's only one play left in this contest, but Doom trailing by one. And we got a holding, but they haven't called anything, and he lets it fly. It's going to be short and incomplete, and the game is over. That's going to do it here from Daytona Beach as... The Aggies of North Carolina A&T end a two-year losing jinx to the Wildcats of Bethune-Cookman. They come away with a one-point victory, 19-18. to Bill Hayes gone to the middle of the field. The teams, I don't see uh, Alvin Wyatt. And I think they're both uh, both coaches are out there. Bill Hayes. There they are. There they are. They're both and coaches they're right there. Hands right there at the middle of the field. And both teams are shaking hands. And it was a hard fought game. Somebody had to win. Somebody had to lose. And it was the Aggies who prevailed today by a point. 19 to 18. Back in a moment to wrap things up. Come away victorious by one over Bethune Cookman and our Jeff Hamlin. Brumlin rather is down on the sideline with Bill Hayes. Bill, congratulations first on the victory. Do you feel that you escaped here this weekend? And uh, do you think you can play any better? Well, I know you probably think you can not play better against FAMU in two weeks, a big game coming up. Well, I'd just like to say for this victory today, I thought both teams played extremely well. Uh, Bethune-Cookman really was scrappy, I'm telling you. But our kids prevailed in the end, and that's what the Aggie is all about. Coach, your team really never had a sustained offensive drive in the ball game. What do you attribute that to? 
Bethune Cookman is a solid football team. Uh, we've got some work to do still. This team has gotten better and better and better, but it kind of leveled off today. We've got to go back to the practice field and try to solve some of our mistakes, and I think we'll be fine. Congratulations, Coach. Thank you, Charlie. All right, Jeff. Next week, uh, the Aggies at home against Dell State, then FAMU close out the season against South Carolina State in Charlotte. For Jeff Rumlin and Ronnie Duncan, Charlie Neal saying so long from Daytona Beach, 1918, the final.